I'm Figan Nizirola, president of OCD New York. I'd like to welcome all of you today for coming to the third OCD Awareness Week conference. And as Blair just pointed out, this will actually be statewide uh, this time around. I'd like to first start off by thanking Blair Simpson and Anthony Pinto and the whole diligence staff of the New York State Psychiatric Institute for providing us the space, the logistics, and all their hard work in making this conference uh, come to fruition. I'm also very, very happy to have OCD New Jersey under the auspices of Dr. Alan Wegg, who's right behind me, who agreed to um, join efforts with OCD New York for this year's conference. So we're hoping that it'll be much more informational and also more enjoyable. We have the New Jersey Mental Health Players, um, I don't know if Sharon White is here. I uh, would like to thank her and her group who's going to be appearing at, uh, after lunch. And many thanks go to all our expert OCD presenters for sharing their knowledge and giving so generously of their time on a Saturday. I'd like to thank my board, uh, Mr. Scott Sokolow and Dr. Stephen Posker over there. Uh, for their contributions throughout the year, and a special thanks goes to Sony Kimlani Patel. Uh, she works endlessly, tirelessly, and with utmost devotion uh, to the OCD community, and without her, really, not much would be get, getting done. So thank you so much. Uh, she thinks through all the way to the water and coffee and everything else, so thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank all our volunteers also, without whom we would not be as organized and prepared as we are today. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank all of you for attending, because without you, we would not exist. We need your support. We need you to volunteer and help us out, because we, your monies, if you're not a member, please become a member, because your money is going to dissemination of information, to do research, and most importantly, to provide therapy for those who are unable to do so for themselves. That is our goal. So we really, really need your assistance in helping OCD New York and OCD New Jersey to grow. Um, we have a couple of announcements. Uh, one is that uh, there will be a break at some point around 11 o'clock, so if you can just uh, please hold off until then, that will be great. Uh, and then we will make announcements throughout in terms of lunch and um, other activities. I'd like to turn it over to Alan Wegg at this point, and again, thank you and welcome for coming. Thanks for you again. And thanks for having us. Thanks for inviting us. Uh, I just want to spend a couple of minutes uh, uh, familiarizing you a little bit with OCD New Jersey. I know that it sounds, you know, people here in Jersey, if you live in the city here, and it's, we might as well be saying we were in Tokyo. Um, but it's exit nine off of the turnpike, just to give you your frame of reference. And um, we've been around for a while. Uh, we've uh, incorporated in, 19, in 1998. And we have several things that are really important that we're very proud of that we've been doing ever since then. We have quarterly meetings, which are uh, relatively local presentations on, um, on some topic of OCD given at Robert Wood Johnson Hospital in New Brunswick. That's in the Rutgers University area. Uh, we've had a lot of the people that you'll be seeing today present, Dr. Uh, Doctors Wayne Goodman, I was just writing this down before, uh, Anth uh, Anthony Pinto, uh, Marla Diebler, who's gonna be speaking. I think so Sony, you've also presented us a while ago. And we also have an annual conference, which is just coming up a week from tomorrow. That's in Somerset County, New Jersey. And that's a, also a full day event similar to this. Um, in the past, you've had Dr. Fugen Azaraglu right here, Dr. Uh, Fred Penzel, Blair Simpson, people again that you've seen here. So we only get like the best of the best. Um, uh, and uh, if you go to our website, which is ocdnj.org, ocdnj.org. You'll find all information about all the stuff that we're doing and information about the upcoming uh, uh, conference. And there's also a flyers on our table outside about that. So I really want to push that. If you want just information about what OCD New Jersey does um, and uh, get little uh, emails, we send them out. I do it. So we send out only one or two a month at most. Um, you can get on an email list, email list which is on the um, home page 
of uh, our website right there. So um, that's uh, pretty much what we do. You know, we, we really are very excited about being part of this community of uh, OCD affiliates that have really sprung up all over the country over the last few years especially. And um, it's really a way of uh, following through with you know, grassroots community-based kinds of uh, help and education. So thanks again for coming. And again, just because you're here in New York City doesn't mean you come, can't come visit us all the way on the other side of the river. Thank you. Okay. And I'm going to join in the welcome. So I'm Blair Simpson, and I run the Center for OCD and Related Disorders. And I'm also going to just move right into my talk, because I'm the first kickoff talk. So thank you, Fugan and Alan. Um, my understanding of it is, is you are part of just not an event today, but an event at local chapters all around the country and potentially the world, although I don't know about that. Um, that's all part of the International OC Foundation, and it's really OCD Awareness Week. So just by coming here, you help us in that ability to raise awareness. And we, by what, what this conference really is, is a sharing across researchers and clinicians with expertise in OCD and, the tri and other related disorders in the tri-state area. I want to um, particularly highlight, you know, Wayne Goodman was one, one of the people fundamental to starting the OC Foundation all those years ago at Yale. And I, st I have a picture of what he used to look like all those years ago at Yale, if I ever need it. Um, but really, it's a, it's a really positive event for us because a lot of times as researchers, we end up uh, competing for limited research dollars, et cetera. But this is an event where we come together with a goal of trying to actually share information and, sh and hopefully be helpful to a broader community. So um, there's a lot that we planned for you today. Our goal was to make the talks shorter, um, go over the basic stuff more quickly, and end up with something newer towards the end. And our goal there was to realize that some people might have come in prior years. So I just want to raise a hand. How many people in the audience came last year? Right, so we wanted to make sure we didn't bore you, right? We wanted to keep you on the outer side. But at the same time, we wanted to bring along new people who hadn't come before. So you'll give us, please give us input on how this forum went. This morning, we're going to be down here in the auditorium, and I'm going to kick off with what is OCD, what causes OCD, and then you're going to see on your schedule, different people are going to speak about different treatments for OCD. Then there's lunch. Then there's the New Jersey Players, uh, which is a sort of a new thing that we're doing brought to us by New Jersey to see you know, more, I don't know, entertainment is the right word, but certainly a different, a, a different shift, Okay, not PowerPoint slides and information then to workshops in the afternoon, and finally we regather here at the end of the day with all the presenters here, and if they're burning questions that you have not been answered, that's that card in your packet to fill out that card, put your question out on the table in a box, um, and I'm gonna moderate a discussion about those final questions, and then we conclude. So um, our hope is uh, it's exciting, it's fun, it's interesting, and most importantly, it's informative. So, uh, let's see. Um, I, let me start. So I got given the topic of what causes OCD? Uh, and uh, I love this question because the simple answer is we don't know, but I'll tell you what we do know. Uh, I'm giving you, I'm a researcher, and one of the things we do as, re as researchers is we let you know right up front where we get our source of funding for so that you can feel confident, hopefully, in the information that I'm providing you that isn't biased. Um, and most of my funding comes from the National Institutes of Mental Health or from foundations. I've only done a small amount of industry-funded studies, and I don't think anything that I'm going to say today um, is, a bias, is biased in any way from that. Now, before I can tell you what causes OCD, actually I need to just quickly review what is OCD, and that provides me a wonderful opportunity to, if you will, preview the day for you, because you're gonna, this morning there's a set, set of lectures and we're all together, but this afternoon you're gonna have choices of what you might or might not wanna go to. So I'm going to weave together what is OCD with what's ahead to help you hopefully think through what would you like to go do in terms of the workshops. So, the first and most important thing, I think, is OCD is a disabling disorder. And anybody in the audience with OCD, anyone in the audience with a family member with OCD, 
obviously knows this, but this is important to sort of highlight because I feel sometimes OCD and anxiety disorders in general are sort of dismissed or seen as trivial or not so important by our mental health systems and by our, our mental health funding uh, systems. So the lifetime prevalence about 2%, more common than schizophrenia. Median age of onset 19, look at the comparison to major depression with 25% of the cases by age 14. So this is something that people often don't recognize, that OCD can often start in childhood and half of the cases by, by the end of adolescence. So today, this is a shout out to two workshops. If you're interested in childhood OCD and adolescent OCD, uh, there's one workshop which is Parenting a Child with OCD run by um, Anne-Marie Albano, Tony, whose last name I can never pronounce, Pulifico? Pulifico. And Alita Angelosante, who I don't know, uh, but from the NYU group. So again, trying to put together a workshop of investigators across institutions to talk about what it's like and how to advise you about parenting a child. Um, in addition, another workshop this afternoon is going to be run by Moira Rin, which is um, how do you use medications in children? And the controversies as well as the reasons for considering medications, um, uh, and that's another workshop. The other thing is that obviously um, OCD is often chronic. Not always, but often. So what it means is when you get the disorder, you can, you're gonna have symptoms that go up and down in general over the course of your life. And if you actually look at the severity of cases um, that actually of the anxiety disorders, I think you can make an argument that it's the most severe with when you get symptoms, you're more likely to have moderate or severe symptoms. So if you add this all up, prevalence, early onset, chronic course, and severity of symptoms, this is how it becomes disabling and knocks people off course. And once people get off course in adolescence or early adulthood, they can, they can not go through life's normal path, and that gets them farther and farther off course. So we're all here today to try to help people get treatment early and get back on course. We all know the hallmarks of OCD, obsessions and compulsions, and obviously um, to be OCD, um, it has to be distressing, time consuming, and impairing. Everybody has intrusive thoughts from time to time. Lots of people have repetitive behaviors. That isn't necessarily OCD. And again, I think we all know this, which is there are many different types of OCD symptoms with a range of types of obsessions and a range of compulsions. OCD can look very, very variable, um, uh, and yet there are certain themes. So some patients will have themes that will have symptoms that focus around harm, either befalling themselves or someone else. Other people will have um, concerns about contamination, and it's a huge range of types of concerns, but it's all about, am I gonna get sick? Is someone else gonna get sick? Is something contaminated? Uh, uh, intrusive thoughts about sex or religion, sort of taboo thoughts, symmetry or exactness, hoarding, behaviors, and then other types of symptoms. And this is an opportunity to emphasize, we, one of the workshops this afternoon is specifically going to focus on hoarding symptoms. And uh, not only how hoarding symptoms look today and how we diagnose that as OCD today, but with a look forward to DSM-5 and how the data suggests that there are some people with hoarding behaviors that it really actually isn't OCD. It's actually going to be something called hoarding disorder. And again, I encourage you, if you're interested in that topic, that's Carolyn Rodriguez and Martha Diebler uh, in an afternoon workshop. <laughs> now, there are other problems that people with OCD can have too. And what's very common in adults are depressive disorders and other anxiety disorders. What can be very common in children and adolescents is tics, Tourette's, attention deficit disorder. Um, and then there are these other sort of look-alike, sort of maybe related disorders, which have been called OCD spectrum. And um, here I want to emphasize, if you're interested in the interaction between tics and OCD, there's a workshop by Kathy Budman and Michael Block this afternoon that's going to focus on that issue. What's tics, what's OCD, and then what happens when OCD is together with tics. Um, and, if, and of the OCD spectrum, uh, today we have a workshop on body dysmorphic disorder. And Sony, I'm so bad, Kem, Kemlani, thank you, uh, is going to run that workshop. 
And the other thing is that people with other disorders can also have OC symptoms. So people with bipolar disorder have a higher rate of OCD than people than in the general population. Up to 25% of people with schizophrenia have OC symptoms. About 10% maybe have actually frank comorbid OCD. And there's a burgeoning literature of the interaction between autism and OCD. Now, it's also important for everybody to know what is not OCD. So again, everybody has intrusive thoughts. Many people have repetitive behaviors. If you've ever had to fly overseas and checked your, whether you have your passport more than once, there's a repetitive behavior. But obviously, that's not OCD. And it's also important clinically to distinguish OCD from other disorders. So yes, sometimes they can occur together, but sometimes they're really separate disorders. And for you to get the best treatment and for your family member to get the best treatment, it's important to be really clear. Is this OCD? Is this not? And uh, as I said, as, uh, there's a workshop this afternoon, Carolyn Rodriguez and Martha Diebler, around OCD and hoarding. Uh, and there's also Anthony Pinto and Fred Penzel are going to talk about OCD versus obsessive compulsive personality disorder. They often co-occur, but they are not the same thing. And I think the, uh, the public and the media often get confused by this. And so I'm very excited you have two of the world's experts in this who are actually going to talk to you about it. Uh, I think I mentioned all the workshops. Did I forget anybody's workshop? No, OK. Do shout out. If, you, if I forgot yours, let me know. So how is OCD treated? So the bottom line of it is, and I think probably most people in the audience know this, there are two first-line treatments. Treatment with a class of medication called serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, I've listed them all here. They all work. You're going to hear a lot in the next talk from Steve Postgar about not only these medications, but what to do when these medications aren't enough or don't work. The other first-line treatment is cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, the first-line treatment is of a very particular type called exposure and response prevention. Some people call it ritual prevention. It's been it has a lot of different acronyms in the literature, but it's really one and the same. And today you're going to hear from uh, Fugen Nezaroglu. She's going to talk to you about the evidence for this treatment. And Alan Wegg is going to talk about um, uh, stories about how to convey the concepts of this treatment. Um, I guess not only to patients, but also to just better understand what it's actually about. Now, unfortunately, as again, people in the audience probably know, um, if you're suffering or you have a family member, sometimes our first line treatments don't work or don't work well enough. So again, as I mentioned, uh, Steve is going to talk about other medication strategies. Uh, uh, Fugen's going to mention sort of what are the new developments in psychotherapy, what are uh, new approaches. And then there are alternative types of treatment. And we're really pleased to have uh, Wayne Goodman here, who's really been at the forefront of these other types of treatments. And he's going to talk to you about those. So that then leads me to what causes OCD? Well, the brain, right? So this is a picture of the human brain. Uh, the, someone's eyes would be here, in the back of their head here, and you're looking on it from the outside, sort of like my brain here. And this is what that brain looks like if you actually put them in a scanner, like a magnetic resonance imaging scanner. Uh, and why do I say the brain? So here's the big picture of this, right, which is anything that I do for my behavior is in the end caused by my brain. So the fact that I'm sitting here speaking to you today is because parts of my brain and circuits in my brain are basically telling my tongue, the muscles in my tongue, how to move, and telling the muscles in my hand how to, how to um, you know, gesture. And so in the end, all of our behaviors are caused by our nervous system, including our central nervous system, which is our brain. But that's a very different question then what causes OCD? And I want to break it into two. So the first one is, well, if uh, behavior is caused by the brain, what in the brain leads to those behaviors? So if I uh, have abnormal behaviors like obsessions and compulsions, what in the brain is actually causing those behaviors, if you get that part? But that's a completely different question about and the assumption there, I'm sorry, the assumption there is that obsessions and compulsions are caused by brain circuits that aren't functioning properly. 
But that's a completely different question than how the brain get like that in the first place. And so we as researchers break this down into this is pathophysiology, just how does the brain produce this behavior? But this is etiology. If it's true that there are abnormalities in the brain, how did the brain develop those abnormalities? And I'm going to take etiology first. And again, I don't think that this is not a clean and answered story. There's a lot of research going on all around the world on this topic. Um, and the summary of it is sort of we wave our hands and say, well, it's something about genes, some vulnerability to OCD, something about the environment, about how the environment interacts with your genes, and then your developmental trajectory. So we know, for example, from family studies, that people uh, with, who have OCD, the rate of OCD in their family members, first degree family members, is 10%, whereas the rate in the general population is more like two. So there's a higher rate of OCD, suggesting maybe there's some genetic vulnerability, but it also could be environmental, because it's a family study. Then you turn to twin studies. Well, OK, identical twins who have the exact same genetic material What's the rate? If one twin has OCD, what's the rate of the other twin having OCD? They're not great twin studies in OCD, but that rate is something like 60%. So the point being is, it's not one-to-one, -one, if you understand that. It's not all genes. The field, then there are genetic studies which have tried to go after certain genes and ask, are these genes or gene variants more common in people with OCD or without. And there's a big, not such a big literature, but a, I'd say a messy literature on that. And I would say, in a summary, the entire field is sort of waiting for these two very large genome-wide association studies. One is uh, funded by the International OCE Foundation, David Pauls, Evelyn Stewart up at Harvard, and another one is funded by National Institutes of Mental Health, Jerry Nestat, with his colleagues. And people are sort of waiting to see what are they finding. The rumor is, which is maybe not so surprising, I'm curious whether Wayne has heard any rumors, the rumor is there's no smoking gun here. There isn't going to be a single gene that leads to OCD. Frankly, it's not a surprise. What there might be are certain genes that maybe lead to a vulnerability, but you're only going to end up with OCD then if a lot of other things happen or don't happen for you. I actually take that as good news. I actually take that the environment can have a big impact on genes to be a great news for those of us who are clinicians and like to treat patients. Because I don't know how to change people's genes, but I do know how to work with people to change their environment, either their internal physiological environment or their external environment. So I actually think that's hopeful. There are a lot of other things in the literature that have also been looked at in terms of etiology. Um, I just want to mention, you know, so for example, there's case studies of manganese poisoning leading to new onset OCD. There are case studies of a stroke of someone just in the wrong part of their brain leading to new onset OCD. Um, uh, and, and when I get to what we think about as pathophysiology, you can see how that might make sense. Because if this is true, that obsessions and compulsions are due to a, a brain circuits that aren't functioning properly, then you can imagine in your mind anything that disrupts those particular brain circuits could lead to OCD. So I actually think it's not surprising that there might be multiple ways to get to something that looks like obsessions and compulsions that you can't control. And I just, I guess, a moment about this, which is there's been in the literature um, a lot of discussion about whether um, streptococcal infection that isn't treated can then lead to an autoimmune response that then uh, those autoantibodies cross the blood-brain barrier, goes and impacts the basal ganglia, which I'm going to talk to you about in a moment, one of the nodes in this hypothesized OCD circuit. And could that lead to tick disorders and or to OCD? And the field is very muddy around it, and it's been very hard to sort of uh, definitively prove it. There is a sense that there's some signal there, but exactly what it looks like and exactly how it works is unclear. So it's not as simple as just PANDAS. So people are now are talking about PANS and CANS, and there's a big controversy in the literature. But again, 
I think it's likely. The way we think about how do you end up with uh, hypertension, well, there are multiple etiologies for hypertension. There isn't just one way. That's the way I would encourage you to think about OCD. There isn't just one way to get to a brain that isn't quite handling the intrusive thoughts and the urge to do repetitive behaviors, um, and that leads to the symptoms. So now I'm going to turn to pathophysiology. Again, what's the dominant model? The dominant model is there's this hyperactive brain circuit. It includes different parts of the brain, uh, orbital frontal cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, a part of the basal ganglia called the striatum, and the thalamus. And these are these frontal striatal, cortical striatal loops. The idea of it is, is that in this circuit, there are lots of different chemicals that uh, is how the cells in these circuits talk to each other, and maybe there are abnormalities in these chemicals as well. And Steve Postgar is going to come back to this because some of our medications alter serotonin, some of them dopamine, and a recent development is focusing on medications that, uh, that adjust, we think, glutamate. And the working hypothesis is that circuit dysfunction leads to problems in neural processing for example, gating of incoming stimuli, so you might be flooded by intrusive thoughts, or trouble stopping urges, for example, so leading to compulsions. And there's some new data to suggest, well, maybe it's something about the balance between goal-directed behavior and habits. Working hypothesis is what I would emphasize. So what's that circuit look like? So again, I'm just showing you a side picture of the brain. Here's where your eyes would be looking. It's like, it's like me looking that way, but it's now halfway. It's showing you in the middle of the brain. Here's the frontal cortex. Here's the orbital frontal cortex. There's the basal ganglia. There's the thalamus. And this is this notion of this hyperactive circuit that's um, uh, uh, acting in such a way that it's hard to actually stop the intrusive thoughts or hard to stop the repetitive behaviors. What we know, though, is it's not as simple as that. It isn't just one darn circuit. In fact, there are other parts of the brain that play very important roles, including what we call the fear circuitry, parts of the brain, the amygdala and hippocampus, and somehow those are getting also activated, which gives that surge of anxiety when people with OCD have their symptoms. There are also um, brainstem nuclei that, when I talk to you about those neurochemicals, serotonin and dopamine, which flood the brain, modulate the cells in the frontal cortex and modulate the circuit. And then the circuit itself has uh, chemicals, glutamate being the major excitatory chemical, GABA being the major inhibitory chemical. So the point of it is, it's a big, complicated brain. We have big, complicated brains, and there's a lot going on, and it isn't simple to say it's one thing. How do we study the brain? And this is really, I'm not going to go through all the data of these slides. It's just to show you. So let me go back for a second. How do we know that there is a hyperactive circuit? Well, there are now a whole plethora of brain imaging modalities which allow you to study the metabolism, the blood flow, the functioning of the brain, and people have focused in on trying to understand how the, these different circuits might interact in people with OCD compared to people without. Um, for example, this is a study, and we and many other people are doing this. This is a study where you actually put people with OCD in a scanner, uh, MRI scanner, and you ask them to do a task to actually, it's to stop themselves. It's sort of like a video game, and you're asking them to stop their responses. And then you can measure activity in that, this circuit in parts of their brain and compare it to activity in people who don't have OCD. Another thing you can do is look at the neurochemicals in the brain. There are a couple of different methodologies for doing this. This is just showing you pictures of a brain in, in a study that we did previously of people with OCD and people without. This was looking at the, uh, one aspect of the serotonin system, the serotonin transporters. But you can look around the brain now at dopamine systems, serotonin systems, uh, glutamate systems, and GABA systems. And this is just showing you another methodology, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, with spectra showing you uh, glutamatergic metabolites versus GABA metabolites. And again, all I'm doing here is illustrating for you different ways that we and other researchers around the country are trying to understand better the pathophysiology underlying obsessions and compulsions. 
But I want to emphasize um, not any particular result, but more the ideas. So how do you interpret these data? So let's say you find, as we found and others have found, that there are abnormalities in metabolism or neurochemical systems or functioning during these cognitive tasks in people with OCD compared to people who don't have OCD. Um, now, one problem is across these studies, there's a lot of variable findings. But again, I'm going to take you back to say maybe that's not so surprising, because do we actually expect everybody with OCD to have the exact same underlying brain abnormality? I don't. And I actually think people with OCD are quite heterogeneity, hetero, uh, a variable group, and I'm not sure that we have sort of um, you know, clean ways of, of dividing people out to really know. But in addition, and possibly more importantly, is these types of brain imaging studies are really just correlations. All, I can, all we can say to you is, well, if I take a group of people with OCD symptoms, and I take a group of people without, and I find um, some problem in the brain or, or you know, difference in the brain, I should say, compared to people without, I don't know whether the difference in the brain is because, uh, is cause or effect. I don't know whether the difference in the brain led to the symptoms or the symptoms led to the difference in the brain, if you understand. So that becomes, a, and it's true across all of these human studies. So if you really want to get a mechanism, this is what people are doing. So what's the ration? And I know, I guess I should go back, which is I know people have different sensitivities about animal models, but this is, in medicine, one of the ways to really know whether some you can actually take a brain circuit in an animal, you can actually alter it, and then actually see if that specifically leads to the behavior you're interested in. It's a lot harder in psychiatric illnesses to do this than you could imagine in diabetes or hypertension. Um, but animal models have played a very, very important role in the field of medicine um, in terms of trying to get to underlying mechanism. So what's the rationale for it? One is to study the molecular and cellular functioning of the brain circuits and genes implicated in OCD. There are things that you can do in a mouse model that, of course, you could never do in a human study. And the real point of it is to identify novel targets for treatment development. Now, again, I appreciate people have sensitivity about it. I completely agree that these, you, the use of animal models need to be carefully done and well thought through. But I just want to put it out there that this is another thing that's going on in the field of OCD research to try to get at that question of what causes obsessions and compulsions. And so different approaches are being taken. One is to study what are considered OCD-like behaviors. So for example, dogs have, there's a model of OCD in dogs called the acral lick model, which if any of you have cats or dogs, you know that there's some dogs who will just groom and groom and groom themselves until they're completely raw. And in fact, I have a cousin who's a veterinarian, and they use serotonin reuptake inhibitors to treat these dogs. Um, so that's, for example, one model. Um, the other thing that people are doing are manipulating genes associated with OCD in mice and studying their effects. So there's a junior faculty member in our group, Susanna Mari. There's one gene that really has been, one gene variant that has been found in a number of studies to be associated with at least early onset uh, OCD, particularly in males. And she's funded from NIMH with a colleague to actually um, I, uh, develop a mouse model of that gene to be able to turn on and off that gene variant over development. So that's another example of how do you now, you have this gene association, how do you figure out what it's doing in the brain that might ultimately lead to something that looks like OCD? And then they're studying neurotransmitter systems in our brain circuits implicated in OCD. So that's, as an example, that same faculty member is using a new technique called optogenetics, which is the ability to actually drive or stimulate different circuits in the brain. And so she's actually, again, in this mouse model, trying to develop the ability to turn on and off different circuits using this new technique. Again, none of this, are th in a funny way, this relates back to Wayne, what Wayne's going to talk about later. There there is this uh, methodology, deep brain stimulation in humans, that is used as a treatment. And we joke with Suzanne that she's sort of doing deep brain stimulation in her mice. But the goal of 
her studies is again to try to understand the functioning of those basic circuits to see if it could lead us to new targets. There's always the problem in an animal model, is it valid? Does, it, does anything we do, in an, we can look at excessive grooming, but is that actually anything related to human beings with OCD? Or is it more like trichotillomania? Or is it just something completely else? But just to show you is this is just the first. This like was a huge splash. It's actually, it's funny, it's now quite a while ago, but um, 2007, but a huge splash. This was a scientist um, who was not interested in OCD at all. He was interested in a specific, what's called a post-scaffolding protein in, uh, and he was particularly, he was like a basic scientist interested just in sort of like the mecha not, not to, you know, mechanics of synapse uh, function. And he was interested in this particular protein and deleted it from his mouse and thought, oh boy, I've got a, you know, nothing's going on here. I don't see anything. But he kept his mice around. And after about, I think it was three or six months, noticed that they groomed themselves to near baldness. So that led him to suddenly be interested in OCD. He's now up at MIT, I think it is, and you know, like really interested now in autism and OCD. So this is just one. I could have given you, you know, five different papers, big nature, science papers, big, big, big publications that there's great interest now in. Uh, in uh, trying to develop this. But again, as I said is, so he altered this protein. They sh this mouse shows this incredible, you know, excessive grooming. He then did the biochemistry of exactly what was going on in the brain that led to this excessive grooming. But is this relevant? You know, we don't know. There might be multiple ways that you could muck up the brain and get excessive grooming, but that may not have any relation in an animal, but that may have no relationship to what people with OCD and human beings, the trajectory they get to with obsessions and compulsions. So, is the itsy bitsy spider obsessive compulsive? Asked the girl to her father. And that's the point, right? Which is just because you got up and down, just because you excessively groom, doesn't mean it's uh, relevant. So I want to end with, um, you know, for those of us who do research, and I think for those of us who are clinicians, you know, what's our goal? So for the patients, this is the way I think of it. I think about the patients of today, and I think about the patients of tomorrow. And so the patients of today, what we'd like to see is early identification and treatment. There's not really good data on this, but certainly our sense of it is the sooner you get there, the better. Because when I see adults in their 30s and 40s, and they haven't made it through college, and they haven't made it... They haven't been able to develop romantic relationships, and uh, you know they, they really have, have sort of, if you will, missed aspects of their 20s and 30s. We can treat their symptoms, but giving them back all that life trajectory is really hard. And so early identification and treatment, increase access to evidence-based treatments. You're going to hear from Fugan about CBT. Lots of people don't get access to it, but I think there's great new ways of making it accessible, and I think Fugan's going to talk about that. And then, of course, improving the delivery of our current treatments. And for the patients of tomorrow, again, our goal is trying to really understand the brain mechanisms that could identify novel targets uh, and that would allow us to develop even better treatments and maybe, maybe one day, figure out how would we prevent the development or progression of this illness. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop, and I'm going to introduce, uh, let's see, Steve is next. So Steve's going to come talk to you more in detail about uh, medication treatments for OCD. Come on up. So uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, like I actually said last year, um, this is actually a great meeting for everybody to attend, including me. Um, you're actually very fortunate. There's really a kind of who's who as far as experts in the world of OCD here. Um, and so we're very fortunate to have all these people volunteering their time. Um, so like Dr. Simpson said, today I'm going to be talking with you about using medications to treat OCD. Uh, I'm going to try to teach everything you ever wanted to know in a half hour. Um, so we might have to keep a somewhat brisk pace. Um, like Dr. Simpson said, that we know that there are some circuits in the brain that might not be functioning well. And the way the brain works is that each brain area is made up of lots of cells called neurons. And the way one neuron talks to the other neuron is by releasing neurotransmitters. And we have several different types of neurotransmitters in the brain. And the medications we use affect the amount of those transmitters, 
um, and also can hit the receptors for those transmitters directly, either causing them to fire or blocking them. Um, for many years, um, there was a long period of time where we had a lot of good medication treatments for depression and anxiety, but nothing for OCD. Um, and then we were very fortunate that people like Dr. Nezaraglu, who will be speaking later, and her husband, Dr. Yura, started looking at a particular medication called clomipramine. And clomipramine is part of a class of medications we call tricyclic antidepressants. And the other tricyclic antidepressants didn't seem to work very well. And yet, for some reason, clomipramine did. So what's so special about clomipramine? So other tricyclic antidepressants affected uh, two main neurotransmitters, predominantly norepinephrine. And they had some effects on the serotonin system, but not really strong effects. Clomipramine, however, was the first drug that really had potent effects on serotonin. Um, and the way that clomipramine affects serotonin is by preventing its reuptake. And so clomipramine is often known as a SRI, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So we have finally a drug for OCD, all is well, and then we got a lot of side effects. Um, many people actually respond very well to clomipramine and tolerate it very well, but some people get more side effects. Um, the most common side effects that we're gonna see with a drug like clomipramine and other drugs in that class called tricyclics are what we call anticholinergic effects. And because what's happening with clomipramine is that we're affecting serotonin, but it doesn't affect serotonin alone. And one of the things it does is it blocks another brain chemical called acetylcholine. And when it blocks that, we can get what are called anticholinergic effects. Um, the very crude way I often describe it to patients is think of everything that normally comes out of you, it comes out less. And so saliva in your mouth, less. So people tend to get dry mouth. Um, urination, people sometimes have urinary hesitancy. It's hard for them to urinate. People get constipation. Um, other symptoms can be sometimes weight gain, as well as some sedation. Uh, the most concerning side effects, which happen fairly rarely, and usually only at higher doses, are the occurrence of seizures and abnormal heart rhythms. Again, these are, are low incidence of these, but they do happen at, at the higher doses and something we have to be careful about. Um, in the depressed population, the other thing we're concerned about with tricyclics is that an overdose, they can actually be lethal. So knowing that we finally had a medication that worked, and we knew it worked by blocking the reuptake of serotonin, we began to look at another class of drugs called the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and these were actually called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So unlike clomipramine, that tended to affect a lot of neurotransmitter systems. SSRIs were more focused on serotonin, but they still actually also have other effects. And so, as you're probably aware, these are some of the SSRIs, Celexa, Lexapro, Prozac, Luvox, Paxil, and Zoloft. One of the things I always like to make clear to people is that in our kind of society, we've kind of equated the word SSRI with antidepressant. And, and that's actually not necessarily the case. And so even though all of the SSRIs are antidepressants can be used to treat depression, not all antidepressants are SSRIs. And so some antidepressants don't affect serotonin at all. Um, a drug like Welbutrin affects more dopamine and norepinephrine. And the lack of its effect on serotonin renders it not very useful for disorders like OCD. And actually, there are other drugs that actually affect serotonin in a different way than blocking its reuptake. Some of those have some evidence of working, but the real class that we see works for OCD are, again, things that affect serotonin in a very specific way, and, and that is blocking its reuptake. And we're going to go over that a little bit more. So SSRIs, how often are they effective? And SSRIs look like they're effective approximately in 50% of patients. Not really the numbers we'd like, but, but a good number of patients actually get some effect. The more important question is, what does it mean for a medication to be effective? Because often our initial kind of instinct is if something's effective, if I have something, it get rid get, gets rid of it. And that's actually not the case. 
And so when we treat disorders like depression, we're actually trying to get what we call remission, complete or almost complete absence of symptoms. This is not something that happens often when we treat OCD. And so we know that out of the approximately 50% of patients that respond, approximate 20 to 40% decrease in OCD symptoms. And we know that a 20 to 40% decrease often correlates with a, with a decent improvement in quality of life. But as you might suspect, if you have a lot of OCD or severe OCD, that often even with that 20 to 40% reduction, people still have a lot of symptoms left. Um, somebody responding completely to an SSRI where they have complete remission of their OCD is unfortunately an all too rare event. So this is a very common question, right? We talked about clomipramine early on, which was the first drug for OCD. And, and the question is, is what's more effective, clomipramine or the SSRIs? And so we look at things called meta-analysis. And meta-analysis is taking a lot of different studies from different time periods of different drugs and kind of lumping them together to try to figure more things out about how these drugs compare to one another and, and how they compare over a, a large population. Um, some meta-analysis have suggested that clomipramine has an edge. It's slightly better for OCD than the SSRIs. It can be a problem, uh, these meta-analysis, because it's very difficult to compare studies due to being done at different times under different conditions. Um, one big problem is that it seems like that the placebo rate that we get in studies has gone up over the years. And so if a drug, let's say, worked 50% improvement in symptoms, but a placebo had 30%, it looks much better than a drug that works 50% of the time and has a 40% placebo response. And so again, it's very hard to necessarily judge using a meta-analysis. If we look at more head-to-head -head studies of one drug against the other, it appears that there's no real difference in effectiveness of clomipramine or SSRIs. Now, just because some research shows that that's still a, a, an issue of controversy in the field. And, and some people clearly still think that there's something different about clomipramine that works possibly a little better. But due to the fact that the SSRIs tend to have less adverse effects than clomipramine, and knowing that they might probably have the same efficacy, we tend to use as the first line treatment the SSRIs. The SSRIs, unfortunately, aren't devoid of side effects. Most side effects from SSRIs are, are in the mild to moderate range, and they, they tend to be very well-tolerated drugs. Um, most of the side effects people get with the SSRIs are usually early on in treatment, usually within the first couple of weeks. Those symptoms are relatively transitory and usually remit pretty shortly. And the most common of those being people can get some GI upset, the gastrointestinal tract, they can get a little nausea, upset stomach. People can also get headaches. And again, that usually tends to remit over the course of a few weeks. The more long-lasting side effects, and, and one of the reasons for people decrease compliance and not wanting to be on the medications, is sometimes they can have some effects on sexual functioning in both males and females. Um, and people can also get insomnia or somnolence, which is just being tired, um, as well as people can get weight gain. The weight gain with SSRIs tends not to be severe. Um, we tend to see a lot more severe weight gain with other drugs like antipsychotics and some of the mood stabilizers. But people can gain some weight on SSRIs. Um, typically, again, it's a few pounds, rarely kind of more than 10 or so, but, but people do. And so this is another huge question. Is there a best SSRI for OCD? And when we look at it, it doesn't appear that any one SSRI is any better than another for the treatment of OCD. Um, there is kind of some lore, um, and probably the most common one I get asked about is, is Luvox. Should I be on Luvox? Is it the best? Um, and part of that comes from Luvox being the first drug to get an indication for OCD. Um, but again, there doesn't seem to be clear evidence that any one medication um, is better than another. But actually, to patients, this is the more important question. Who cares about everybody else's OCD? For my OCD, is there a best drug? And, and Dr. Simpson alluded to the fact that OCD probably has a number of different causes and, and a number of different ways that circuits get affected. And so what we know is that in a given individual, although 
SSRIs in general seem to be equally effective. Some people, for whatever reason, respond to one medication and not the other. People might respond to Zoloft and not Paxil, or Paxil and not Luvox. Um, we still don't have kind of enough evidence to show that we can kind of predict who that's going to be in. We, we do keep looking at different areas, and, and one thing that Dr. Simpson discussed is, you know, the different types of OCD. Do people with more contamination symptoms, do they respond to one SSRI, whereas people with more hoarding symptoms respond to another? There's some suggestion, but there's no real clear evidence that we can kind of go by. And so given that, that we kind of know that all SSRIs are, are somewhat equivalent, how do we choose which one we're going to use? And one of the things we look at is adverse effects. Um, and again, adverse effects is a tricky issue because one person's adverse effect is another person's bonus. And so somebody that is really agitated and, and has a lot of insomnia, a sedating antidepressant might be helpful. And so there are certain SSRIs that are more sedating. Other people, they get more kind of sedated and they need an SSRI that's more activating. And so each one of the medications we use of the SSRIs has a little bit differences in side effects. So we, we use that to kind of determine which we're going to go with. Uh, the other thing we look at is potential drug interactions. And so we look at what other medications somebody's on and depending on that, we can look at the different SSRIs and which ones might have a negative interaction. The other thing we look at that seems somewhat obvious is past treatment response. Somebody comes in, they say, I used to be on Prozac for my OCD and it worked. It's probably a good place for me to start. The other thing is family history uh, and of medication response. And, and like Dr. Simpson discussed, there seems to be some genetic component that clearly is involved in OCD. And knowing that we share some genes with our family, all things being equal, if I know somebody in the family, especially if that person has OCD, responds to Prozac or a particular SSRI, that might be the one I choose. Uh, again, there's no perfect kind of way to do that, and it doesn't work all the time. But all things being equal, it might be something that influences the choice. The other thing is, is the presence of co-occurring medical conditions and, and psychiatric conditions, uh, and looking how each particular medication might affect that differently. I'm just going to get a quick sip because my mouth is dry. So we use the SSRIs for a lot of different disorders. They're actually effective in all the anxiety disorders as well as depression. And yet, there's a difference in how we use them in OCD as opposed to other anxiety disorders and depression. And one thing is dosage. In OCD, we often need higher doses of medication of the SSRI than we typically use for other anxiety disorders or depression. The other thing is how long it takes to respond. And so in, in major depression, often people will see some response even within the first two weeks, and greater and greater response over time. In OCD, often it takes longer to start to see a response, sometimes four to six weeks, and sometimes as many as eight to 12. Um, and so it often takes eight to 12 weeks to figure out if this medication is working for somebody or not. So this is the part where it gets really interesting, or for some of you, this is probably the point where you're going to close your eyes for a little bit. So how do SSRIs work? And I think I have a little laser here. And so how do SSRIs affect? So this is what we call a synapse. And a synapse is just a fancy name for where one neuron, which is called the presynaptic neuron, talks to another neuron. And it does this by sending out a transmitter. And these particular ones are, are serotonin transmitters. We also have what's called a serotonin transporter, or sometimes called a pump. And basically what this does is as serotonin pours out, and there gets to be a lot in the synapse, this transporter kind of sucks them up and puts it back into the neuron. What SSRIs do is they actually block this pump. So now all that serotonin is not getting sucked back up, so we have more in the synapse to go and hit the receptors. So in OCD, we've kind of looked at exactly where, once we kind of do that, where the medications are having their effect in OCD. And, and there are a couple of specific receptors that we have a lot of interest in. These are what are called autoreceptors. And what an autoreceptor does really is when there gets to be a lot of serotonin in the synapse, it'll hit the autoreceptor on the first neuron. And it's a way of saying, look, you're making too much, you're releasing too much, slow everything down. 
And, and so when it hits these 1D receptors, as well as 1B receptors, it slows down the release. And actually, when we give somebody a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, it increases serotonin, but actually not as much as you would think. And that increase actually happens fairly quickly, within a day or so. And yet we know that symptoms don't resolve in a day or so. So it's clearly not that initial release. But what we think happens is that as these serotonin hits these autoreceptors over and over again, actually these autoreceptors become less sensitive to it. And now over time, when serotonin hits them, it actually doesn't cause it to stop releasing. And so once we, what we call, desensitize these, we actually get more and more serotonin release. And, and some of the receptors we think are involved in OCD is when it hits receptors such as 2C and, and the 2A receptor. So now we're going to kind of do what every good talk does, and we're going to talk about guinea pig brains. And so what have we learned from guinea pig brains? So the really interesting thing is that when we look at the brains of guinea pigs, we can actually look at specific kind of areas of their brain and see how much serotonin is being released and how, much, and how long it takes to desensitize these receptors. And if we look at the guinea pig brain and we treat them, and in the past they've used Paxil to treat the guinea pig brain, and they've actually seen that in areas like the hippocampus and the hypothalamus, which are, we know are key components in, in causing depression, that it takes about three weeks for these receptors to downregulate, to desensitize, and to get that increase in serotonin release. Interestingly, if you look at an area called the orbital frontal cortex, which Dr. Simpson discussed, which seems to be a primary area in OCD, it actually takes eight weeks of Paxil treatment to reduce the sensitivity of these receptors. And, and that kind of adds more validity to this model that it probably is the orbital frontal cortex that's involved. And, and again, that these kind of receptors downregulate at different rates. So if treatment for OCD is unsatisfactory, so if I treat someone for OCD, I'm giving them a particular medication, I get the dose up fairly to a, a high enough level, and they're not responding, what do I do? And, and so the first thing is to figure out, are they taking the drug? This actually seems like a silly question, but it's actually surprising how often people actually aren't taking the medication. Uh, another thing that actually tends to happen more than you might think, especially with young patients who aren't used to taking kind of daily medications, is that people get into the habit of thinking, when I have a headache, I take Tylenol. Some people say, when my OCD is bad, I take my SSRI. When it's not bad, I don't. And sometimes we actually don't think to explain to them that it needs to be taken every day. The other thing we go back to is diagnosis. Again, something Dr. Simpson talked about. If the medication's not working, I first have to also question my diagnosis. Is this OCD? Is it not something else? Could it be the worry instead of obsessions? Could these really be the worries of generalized anxiety? Could they be the ruminations found in major depression? Also, sometimes tic disorders. People can have very complicated tics that actually look like OCD compulsions. And so if the medication's not working, I have to go back and check and see if I, I actually have the right diagnosis of OCD. The other thing is, is co-occurring conditions. And we know that actually it's more the rule than the exception that in OCD, people often will have another psychiatric illness. And, and that psychiatric illness can actually affect the ability to get better. And, and so often when another psychiatric illness isn't being treated, no matter how well you treat the OCD, the OCD won't get better. Um, this is actually often the common case when people have OCD and bipolar disorder. If the bipolarity and the mood instability isn't solved, often it drives the OCD. All right, so we're going to speed up. So. Effective strategies for managing treatment resistance in OCD. And so we have two big strategies, switching the medication to another, or augmenting and adding a medication, or adding CBT. There actually isn't a lot of evidence to guide us on what the better technique is. And, and it really is affected on a case-by-case -case basis. Some of our augmentation strategies include using atypical antipsychotics. And so if a person has a history of tics, we actually know they often have a better response than regular OCD patients due to these atypicals. And so that might actually lead me to augment instead of switching if they have tics. Also, people sometimes who have symmetry-related obsessions do better on atypical augmentation. 
people have a partial response. So if I'm giving someone a medication and they're responding but not fully, I might decide to try to augment that response as opposed to trying another medication which might not work at all. The other thing is a need for more rapid response, and we're going to discuss how that adding certain medications, actually we can get somewhat of a rapid response. And so if somebody's not responding and I, I need to get a quicker response, switching the medication can often take a long time for it to build up in the system and, again, waiting that period for it to start working. So our evidence for switching another SSRI is about 11 to 33 percent who switched from one to the other that wasn't working got improvement. Um, one of the questions is always, do we switch somebody from an SSRI to clomipramine? Um, and I can say that in general practice, often people will, will decide to, if they give one or two trials on an SSRI, give a trial of clomipramine. And again, they have the, the thought that there might be something a little different about it. So now we're going to very quickly go over augmentation strategies. And so the most evidence-based augmentation strategy that we have is adding low doses of antipsychotics. Um, it's always important to kind of talk to patients about this because often when people hear the word antipsychotic, they get nervous. Um, these drugs are also called neuroleptics, and, and these drugs actually affect both dopamine and serotonin. Um, we use them at lower doses, and so these aren't the same doses that we use for disorders such as schizophrenia. The older drugs called the typicals, like Haldol, and some of the atypicals that have been shown to be effective are Risperdal, Abilify, Seroquel, and Zyprexa. And so what do we know about low-dose antipsychotics? Out of all the augmentation strategies we have, it appears to have the most evidence behind it. We know that about a third of people will get a response when we augment with antipsychotics. Also, we know that people will often usually get a response if they are going to respond within a month. And they seem to be, while they can help all people with OCD, that it seems like they work even better on people that also have a tick-related disorder along with the OCD. The big problem with these atypical antipsychotics is, is what's called metabolic syndrome. And so some people will get metabolic syndrome, which consists of weight gain, Sometimes it increases in cholesterol, their low-density lipids as well as triglycerides. And also people can sometimes get some insulin resistance, almost a, a pre-diabetic condition. And, and so this is the downside of atypicals. Um, some atypicals, such as Iprexa, cause this more often. Some, like Abilify, seem to cause it less often. Um, so now we're kind of going to get to the big stuff. What is the current stuff going on? So what's hot? Oh, no. Okay, no. So really the, the hot thing in psychiatry right now, is, which is not immune to fads, is glutamate. And glutamate has actually been shown to, to work in a lot of disorders. And so there have been a lot of studies early on, especially on schizophrenia, but now actually also on depression, on using drugs that modulate the neurotransmitter glutamate. And what do we know about glutamate? It's the main excitatory neurotransmitter in our brain. And in OCD, we've actually had some interesting findings. One finding that we've seen is that the cerebral spinal fluid of people with OCD compared to people without seems to have higher levels of glutamate. And so there's a question that the people with OCD have too much glutamate. Um, we also look at some gene studies, and, and some of the genes that have been associated with OCD include genes for some of the glutamate transporters, um, particularly one in a similar way, the way that serotonin has a pump. There seems to be a gene involved with OCD that affects the neuron pumping back glutamate back up into the cell. Um, and we also kind of have seen several treatment studies work. And, and so there, it does appear that glutamate is, a, is an important neurotransmitter in OCD. And this is our kind of mini model of the circuit that we talked about. And this is this cortical striatal thalamic circuit. And as you see here, there's glutamate. And so it would make sense that glutamine would be a key player in OCD because it is responsible for a lot of the transmission in this circuit. And so the first drug we're going to talk about that affects the glutamate system is a drug called Riluzole. We were lucky enough to get a lot of these slides from Dr. Christopher Pittenger, who's one of the real experts in glutamate. And all the medications that affect glutamate affect it a little bit differently. And so the way Riluzole seems to work is that we have cells that, similar to the way serotonin, they have 
pumps that pump glutamate back into the cell. And these are called glial cells. And so what we know is that really is all blocks this pump. Or, I'm sorry, it actually increases the activity of this pump. And so we get more pump of the glutamate out of the cell, decreasing our levels of glutamate. Um, really is also seems to work by affecting sodium, sodium channels that have the electricity run down. And so it decreases the amount of the electricity going down the neuron causing to the release of these neurotransmitters. And here's an open label study of glutamate. And again, these aren't placebo controlled trials, but it appears that glutamate actually works fairly well, seeing about 50% of people having a response to adding the addition of Riluzole. Another drug people use is called memantine or nemenda, which is commonly used for Alzheimer's disease. And this affects the glutamate system a little differently. This actually blocks one of the main glutamate transporters, the NMDA receptor. And by blocking this, again, we get decreased kind of transmission of glutamate. And there have been several studies, again, smaller studies in open trials, of using the MENDA as an augmenting strategy in OCD. There are many other drugs that we're also using that affect the glutamate system that we're trying for OCD. Probably one of the most interesting is a drug called D-cycloserine. And so the way D-cycloserine works is actually part of this NMDA receptor, in order to get neurotransmission, not only does glutamate have to hit it, but also glycine or D-serine, which actually hit another spot. And so for that communication to happen, you need both glutamate and one of these molecules. And so what we know is D-cycloserine works at this kind of what we call a coagonist site. And, and so the interesting thing about, about D-cycloserine is it's actually used in a different way than we use most drugs. It's actually used in combination with CBT. And, and what we know is that these NMDA receptors are involved in learning. And, and what we do is we've tried to give people some D-cycloserine, not on a daily basis, but just before getting exposure and response treatment and, and seeing if they actually get a better response. Um, there have been several studies, um, and, and the studies kind of have gone back and forth. One thing that seems clear is that we often get a faster response. And so even if a group of patients responds to exposure response prevention, the group who's getting the D-cycloserine actually responds quicker. And, and so that's not an unimportant thing in OCD. Again, these trials have been difficult because it really is about figuring out how early to give the D-cycloserine. And some that have given it four hours before haven't done as well as when we give it two or one hour before. Um, and so again, this is something still figuring out. But again, it's a really exciting uh, thing in psychiatry. We also know that other medications like ketamine, which similar to, um, which similar to Nemenda, blocks the glutamate receptor it actually blocks it much more strongly. And if you open up any kind of psychiatric journal these days, uh, the hot thing is looking at ketamine actually as a treatment for depression as well. And it actually people seem to have a very rapid response um, to ketamine. Other chemicals we use are things like N-acetylcysteine, lamictal, dipyramate, glycine. These have all had kind of somewhat mixed results, and, and again, probably the best results we've seen so far out of these glutamate modulators appears to be with Aureliazole and the, the Menda. And so lastly, I'm going to talk about a drug that works differently called Ondansetron, or Zofrin. And Zofrin, uh, its main use is, is usually for kind of nausea and vomiting after treatments like chemotherapy and surgery. And, and what it actually does, it affects a specific kind of serotonin receptor, the serotonin type 3 receptor. And it blocks that receptor. And, and what we think is that by blocking that receptor, it affects dopamine. And, and the dopamine system is another system that we think might play a role in OCD. And that it might be an increase in dopamine um, and too much dopamine neurotransmission that affects OCD symptoms. And a very interesting finding looking at people with cocaine addiction. And they've tried to treat cocaine addiction with ondansetron. And the interesting thing is that ondansetron, when looking at the brain, was shown to actually inhibit the right orbital frontal cortex. And, and so what would make sense that it would be a useful drug in OCD, where we know that the orbital frontal cortex can be <laughs> hyperactive. And here's a, a recent study. This is actually a placebo-controlled trial, uh, relatively short, and as you can see, that this is people taking just fluoxetine 
and these are the people taking the fluoxetine and the ondansetron. Um, ondansetron is usually well tolerated. Currently, it's undergoing a, a larger um, placebo-controlled trial. The, the last thing, actually, I did want to discuss is, is amphetamine um, and a stimulant. And stimulants have always been a very controversial area in OCD, many people thinking that they make OCD worse. It appears in some cases they do, but in other cases, actually we've seen some effect from adding a stimulant um, to somebody's SSRI or alone for OCD. Um, and so there have been some smaller studies. Uh, very interestingly, they were doing a study of, of using a stimulant, and they wanted to have a placebo group. But they figured that everybody in the placebo group would know they weren't taking the stimulant because stimulants cause side effects, some hyperactivity, some agitation. And they said, well, it's not really a good study if everybody knows that they're not taking the drug. So instead of having a, a placebo group, they actually had one group take the stimulant. And another group, they gave pills with caffeine in it, thinking that, again, they would have the stimulating effects and, and not know that they were actually not on the stimulant. And it turned out that actually both groups did well for OCD. And, and, and one of the interesting things is that, is that maybe kind of the, the, the same way that the stimulant works, that the caffeine actually was also helpful in OCD. Again, there hasn't been a ton of research, but it, but it is a kind of growing area. I know that was a very quick bounce back and forth. Um, like they said, we're going to kind of, I think, have some time to talk later in the day uh, during the lunch session where people can ask more questions. Thank you very much. Well, I also have some hot topics to talk about within CBT, so Steve is not the only one. Okay, so uh, until I get to my hot topics, you'll have to bear through all the boring stuff. Um, CBT, exposure and response prevention, everyone has heard of that. You all know by now probably that if you're going into therapy, you're supposed to ask what type of therapy do you do, and if you get the response, exposure and response prevention, well, then the therapist at least has an idea what that they're supposed to do. That doesn't mean they're going to do it properly, but at least they know that that's what they're supposed to do. Um, then cognitive therapy, and then I'll go into the adjunct of therapies, which are the hot topics. So what is exposure and response prevention? Basically, it's exposing you to your fears or situations or objects or people, and then <clears throat> preventing the person from engaging in the ritual or the compulsion. Um, exposure and response prevention can be done both in imagination and in vivo. It's preferable in vivo, meaning in the environment, in actuality. Uh, sometimes when we have mental rituals or things that are more obsessional, we can really convert them into an in vivo exposure. So the fact that you have an obsession uh, more so than a compulsion doesn't mean that we can't really do exposure in vivo. Cognitive therapy um, is also equally effective, as we will see. Uh, basically, it's identifying the particular thoughts, challenging them, and replacing uh, the irrational, maladaptive thoughts with rational ones. Cognitive therapy probably works because there are quote, behavioral experiments, and we can think of behavioral experiments as actual exposures. So in reality, uh, what you, the type of treatment you should be getting is exposure and response prevention, where you're actually um, facing your fears. If all you're doing is sitting there and challenging your thoughts, uh, be wary of whether, in fact, there's going to be change in your treatment. How does uh, ERP work? Just as we heard uh, about how medications may be affecting our brain, uh, actually cognitive behavioral therapy works in very similar ways. Uh, number one, by merely exposing you repeatedly to the same fears, f something called habituation occurs. Habituation is basically bombardment of the neurons over and over and over again in the brain reticular formation until fatigue or extinction occurs. We also have evidence from brain imaging studies, our own work in looking at serotonin activity changes with purely behavioral therapy, meaning that you can get 
the same kind of chemical uh, changes that we're, that we're getting th with medications by purely doing uh, intensive behavioral therapy. So what are you going to do when you enter into treatment? What is ERP? What can you expect from ERP? Well, number one, most likely you're going to be developing a hierarchy of the list of situations, stimuli, objects that create anxiety for you. And um, we'll see in the next slide that the anxiety may go from very low anxiety to severe terrorizing uh, exposure. But let me just say that by the time you get to an anxiety level of 100, if we're doing 0 to 100, you really are not terrified. Uh, you have learned to tolerate the anxiety, and your response is going to be less and less. Because as habituation occurs, there is a peak in your anxiety at some point, a spontaneous cognitive change that occurs followed by a decrease in the anxiety. Now, that doesn't mean that your anxiety will not go up again an hour later, half an hour later, or the next day. But each time that your anxiety goes up, it goes up less and less and less. Here's an example of a hierarchy for someone who has an AIDS contamination phobia. As you can see, maybe for those who have watched the movie Philadelphia, just watching the movie may be anxiety provoking. Seeing someone getting AIDS and what they experience, um, people's reaction to it, all may produce some anxiety. So starting with that, then you may read some literature on AIDS, for example. Uh, it may also be that we expose you to feeling sick or to things that look like blood or taking you to a doctor's office or taking you to a hospital or maybe ultimately sitting in a chair in a laboratory and getting your blood drawn. All of these things can create anxiety at different uh, degrees. When someone uh, is determining, how often do I need therapy? Well, one of the things, criteria, at least that I use, is determining how mild is your OCD in terms of interference. Weekly sessions are perfectly fine for a lot, a lot of people. If you're basically going to school, uh, functioning at home, um, at work, but you're experiencing obsessions and compulsions. It's producing some form of mild to moderate anxiety or distress for you. Um, it is interfering, but to not really to the point where it's devastating. It's not taking up more than an hour at least of your time. You're probably going to do OK with weekly. If you have moderate interference, meaning that, again, you're functioning at work, you're functioning at school, at home, but you have some difficulty, uh, your performance is declining over uh, in, in those various different situations, uh, and there might be some possible negative consequences. You're arriving to work late. Uh, you've gotten a warning or two. Uh, you used to cook all the time, and now you're not able to cook, or it's taking you longer, uh, and you have moderate to high anxiety, then our recommendation would be to do um, CBT two to three times a week. Now, we, we are hearing a lot about intensive treatment um, Intensive treatment is utilized for a variety of reasons. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're not functioning, but let's start with those. Group of people who are basically not able to go to school, not able to work, um, not able to do leisure activities. Um, they're feeling pretty incapacitated. Their anxiety level is off the wall. They're spending more than three to eight hours. Maybe their obsessions and compulsions are all day long. Even if it's not overtly being manifested, it's always in the back of their mind. Um, for those individuals, intensive treatment, meaning five days, six days a week, anywhere from 90 minutes to six hours a day, is probably beneficial. But as we will see, intensive treatment uh, treatment may be beneficial for those who want a rapid recovery. 
Uh, maybe it's a student who wants to go to college or someone who's having difficulty and finding that maybe they would benefit from having an intensive treatment program during the summer so that they could do better in college. Um, when we look at intensive treatment in CBT to see whether is it really better than weekly, well, there's a trend that it's better. What, what does that mean? Well, basically, it seems that if you're depressed, you do do better in intensive treatment than in weekly treatment, that you do recover quicker at post-treatment. When your treatment is done, you're doing better. However, if we follow those people who have had not so intensive versus intensive, at follow-up, meaning three months, six months down the line, they're doing equally well. So at follow-up, there doesn't seem to be a difference. But again, you may want a speedier recovery or you need to get um, the results sooner for some reason. We have people who come in who are going to get married. They're going to have a child. Um, they want to go for another job, um, and they know that the next boss may not be as tolerant of their lateness. So there are a lot of reasons why people may want intensive treatment. The second thing is um, I'd like to emphasize that what we read in the literature and what actually happens in clinical practice are two different things. We're told that you should respond to OCD in 20 sessions if you get CBT. Usually that does not occur. Uh, why? Same thing with intensive versus weekly sessions. Why is it our clinical practice shows us something different? Because the people that enter our research uh, studies, no matter whether we're talking about pharmacological studies or CBT studies, they are pure OCD. Very often they don't have comorbid conditions. They're highly motivated. Um, they really meet a very strict criterion. So don't be discouraged if you're not responding as quickly as you're told you're supposed to. Same thing with intensive treatment. Our clinical practice does seem to indicate that individuals who are in intensive certainly do better quicker. And for those who have not responded to weekly sessions, again, they seem to do better with intensive. Um, this is another study indicating, as you can see, the intensive group showed an 85% improvement at the end of treatment. Um, the weekly group showed 55%. So obviously, there was more reduction in symptoms in the intensive versus the weekly, but no difference between the two groups at follow-up. Let's look at how well do we do with CBT. Well, not as well as I would like. Um, we were very thrilled with CBT, and we're very still pretty uh, thrilled with CBT, providing you can go through CBT, providing you come into sessions, providing you follow through on homework assignments, providing that you're highly motivated, um, providing that your stressors of other aspects of your life are minimum. But we have 50% of patients who are not responding optimally. That doesn't mean they're not responding. They're not responding optimally. But 25% don't enter into treatment because they're afraid. Uh, do you blame them? Don't we all run away and avoid things that we're fearful of? It makes perfect sense. So sometimes... You just need that willingness to try something difficult. Sometimes the therapist has to make something difficult a little less difficult, uh, and you have to find the motivation to engage in the treatment. 25% do not improve. Those are the people that we're most concerned with uh, because maybe we can get this 25% to participate. But 25% do not improve. The 25% that relapse at follow-up again, is not as important as the ones that don't improve because once they enter into booster sessions, they improve again. And you never go back to the level that you were at when you first came into treatment. Um, so even if you relapse, it's not going to be as bad as where you started off. One. Two, that if you know the strategies and you implement the strategies immediately, you're likely to get the improvement rapidly back. 
So 75% improve with treatment to some degree. Some improve very much. Um, some don't have symptoms left. Uh, and some improve mildly to moderately. Among the 75 that do improve, 50% uh, improve optimally or 50% do not improve optimally, as you saw on the uh, previous slide, uh, leaving again the 25% without any improvement. So who, who are our groups of individuals who are not perhaps responding to our treatment? Here are some obstacles that we see. Overvalued ideation, and we'll get into what that is. Comorbid disorders. Personality disorders. Disgust reaction, more so than anxiety reaction. And engagement in treatment. Let's start with overvalued ideation. Overvalued ideas are the degree to which you are convinced that your belief is true. Individuals who have high overvalued ideas, meaning they strongly believe that their fears are realistic, reasonable, accurate, um, that other people should think like them, that, there's, that somehow the rest of us lack knowledge, um, are, so that they're very convinced, are resistant to change, and overvalued ideation is considered to be a poor prognostic indicator. Various different individuals have found that OVI is a poor uh, diagnostic indicator, prognostic indicator, rather. So OVI is not only a poor indicator for CBT, but also uh, medication response. In a study that we did actually with Anthony Pinto, where we looked at um, fluvoxamine response in those who had high OVIs and those who had low OVIs, what we found is that those with high OVI did not respond over the course of 10 weeks of treatment to fluvoxamine. For both BDD and OCD, we also found in an inpatient uh, setting that those with high OVI did not respond as well. OCD, comorbid to other uh, disorders. If someone has schizoaffective or schizoobsessive uh, disorder, they're less likely to respond. In a study that, um, actually it's one of the few studies I think where we looked at outcome having a schizoaffective uh, personality, schizoobsessive personality or comorbid condition, um, if you treated both the OCD and the personality at the same time, then there was uh, improvement. Most people have found that there's at least one other axis one or clinical di diagnosis other than OCD. Comorbid depression is quite common, but you need to really differentiate if the depression is a separate comorbid condition or is secondary to OCD. What does that mean? It means that are, is the individual depressed because they have OCD? As Dr. Simpson was pointing out, if you miss out on a large part of your life because of OCD, if you're not achieving your goals, you're not enjoying life because of OCD, well, certainly you're going to be depressed. But if we got rid of your OCD, then your depression would go away. So that, in that case, it's not really comorbid. If we can fix OCD, then the de depression lifts. But there are individuals, uh, we see this more actually in the spectrum disorders, such as body dysmorphic disorder, where depression is truly secondary um, is truly an independent comorbid condition such that even if the OCD or the BDD is lifted, the individual is still depressed about other aspects of their life. Personality disorders is really important to diagnose and treat along with um, the OCD. And I think Anthony Pinto is going to talk about not only the differentiation between OCPD and OCD, but perhaps uh, how we can deal in treatment with both disorders. The comorbid personalities that are most frequently seen in OCD is obsessive-compulsive, avoidant, and paranoid. 
Uh, this does not mean they're delusional. Basically, it's just some suspiciousness, usually centering and related to their uh, concerns or subtypes of OCD. I mentioned disgust. Disgust is a different reaction than anxiety. If you're disgusted, you have Ugh! that kind of response, right? Your nostrils go up. It's like you want to reject um, ingestion of something. That's where the word disgust comes from. Avoiding, not ingesting something that could be harmful to our bodies. So we have that kind of reaction. Along with it, nausea, um, a feeling of uh, po possibly vomiting, uh, repulsion. So what does that have to do with, uh, with anxiety, and what does that have to do with OCD? Well, think about it for a minute. There is a form of OCD that is what I call the yucky, icky feeling, but it's that feeling of, I have no disastrous consequences. I just have this response. I just don't want it on me. I don't like the stickiness on me. It's, it's repulsive. It's just dirty, but not that I'm afraid I'm going to get sick. I'm not concerned about giving somebody an illness or getting an illness. I just don't like it. I have an aversion to it. So in contamination phobics, primarily, we see this particular response. Um, and disgust in the brain has a different center than anxiety. And one of the things we're finding is that, um, sorry, I'm trying to go back. Um, what we find is that it takes longer to habituate to disgust than it does to anxiety. So if you have that icky, yucky feeling versus I'm double-checking the stove because it makes me anxious that I might start a fire, or I'm not touching this uh, red-looking thing because I'm afraid it might be AIDS and I will get AIDS or I'll give AIDS to somebody else, um, you're more likely to habituate quicker to the consequence of, of when you have a consequence, when you feel anxious, than when you feel disgusted by something. OK, engagement in treatment. The most consistent predictor of how well you're going to do is whether you engage. No brainer, right? Obviously, if you don't engage, you're not getting treatment. So you may be showing up but you're not really there. As I said earlier, people drop out. They don't come to treatment. But then you have a group of people who are not engaging, but they're there. They come, but they don't do any of the homework as, uh, assignments. They come, and they talk about other things. And no matter how much you get them to focus on a particular task or you want them to do something in exposure exercise, um, they divert your attention ba back to something else, or they have a crisis every week and they need to deal with the crisis. Um, other forms of lack of engagement is not showing up, arguing with the therapist. Now, that doesn't mean you can't discuss something or disagree, obviously, but if you're always arguing and questioning and not doing what is being asked of you or suggested to you, then there might be some fear uh, or lack of motivation uh, to engage. Who is resistant? Who are these uh, individuals who are not doing well? Well, individuals who are not engaging in treatment, who are avoiding, obviously, and those who are satisfied with little progress or partial progress. It may be quite a bit of progress, but you can go further. They say, oh, this is enough. You know, uh, it's great. I'm doing well. And they don't want to keep doing more. Partial responders are more likely to relapse. Partial responders are more likely to um, find that they're doing OK for a little while, but they're picking up momentum, and the symptoms are coming back. Uh, and before you know it, it snowballs, and you're back to, again, not where you were, but your symptoms and your OCD has returned. 
Treatment resistant individuals are those who do not practice response prevention between sessions. One of the reasons intensive treatment works uh, sometimes better is because the person has constant supervision, encouragement, and constant exposure. So if you're having difficulty doing the exposure um, yourself between your sessions, well, if you have to come back the following day, one, you may be more likely to practice, or two, at least somebody's going to keep doing it with you until it no longer produces anxiety for you. Treatment-resistant individuals are those who are, still have overt or mental compulsions uh, existing or left. Or your belief system, your behaviors, your anxiety level um, is still not within average. Aim for average. It may be also that we, as therapists, are failing. Uh, we may not be either pushing, pacing properly. We may not be cajoling you to do something that is the right time to do it. We may not be constructing our hierarchies properly. We may not be giving you adequate trials. Just like in medications, you need to have adequate trials in order to see whether you do respond or you don't respond. OK. At least I think these are hot topics. <laughs> so we have motivational interviewing, which we, uh, has been used basically uh, with substance abusers. That's where most of it has been used with addiction literature and a little bit in depression. Basically, um, motivational interview is looking at the pros and cons of why you should engage in treatment, why you should enter treatment. Um, what are the short-term and long-term benefits, looking at those and um, helping the individual get motivated. And you need motivation to do anything, but certainly if it's something fearful that all of us want to avoid. No one wants to suffer. No one wants to do something that's difficult. But sometimes the only way to get over it is really to face the, the fear. Steve mentioned uh, decycloserine. So he found this to be a hot topic. I find it to be a hot topic, too. Uh, he spoke um, about what do we do with decycloserine. Well, basically, uh, as he mentioned earlier, we use it in combination with exposure. And there's some evidence to indicate that basically if you give it prior to your exposure and response prevention uh, exercises, you may be responding um, quicker, and also you, they have found that you tend to generalize and to uh, remember your, your behavior better than if you had just purely done exposure. Um, you, in other words, it's somehow affecting our memory and recollection that the feared situation, place, or person is not actually dangerous. As I said before, when you habituate, your anxiety comes down. But that doesn't mean that your anxiety doesn't go back up in a little while. So in some ways, um, decycloserian is helping you to remember that what you feared is really not that dangerous. So that habituation curve is occurring um, better, quicker. Here are the studies that I think that Steve had also mentioned some, uh, basically showing that decycloserian significantly improved OCD symptoms both at mid-treatment uh, but also affected their depressive symptoms as well. We're beginning to hear a lot about acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, it's a third wave behavioral therapy, uh, basically it's a form of behavioral therapy. Um, ACT involves acceptance of unpleasant thoughts, feelings, and making a commitment to pursue your life values regardless of your thoughts and regardless of your um, feelings. 
So regardless of your OCD symptoms, one is encouraged to just go on with your life. You have to have a willingness to accept the anxiety. That's what it amounts to, willingness to accept anxiety. If you have a thought, you observe the thought, you acknowledge the thought, and then let the thought go away. Don't give importance to your thought. Don't try to control your thought. It's different than cognitive therapy. In ACT, you don't try to challenge thoughts. Um, you don't try to identify maladaptive thoughts. Basically, you have a thought. You say, I have this thought. I have a thought that I'm going to start a fire if I don't go back and check the um, stove. It's just a thought. I have a million and one thoughts a day, and I'm going to let that thought go away. It's going to float away. It's going to, if you want to visualize marching soldiers, each thought is a one soldier marching away uh, with the thought. On the other hand, in cognitive therapy, basically you identify the thought and you challenge the thought and try to change the thought. Now, identification of the thought, by the way, is very, very important because one doesn't identify the thought that I'm going to start a fire and then start challenging whether you're going to start a fire or not. But basically, the probabilities and uh, your ability to take a risk, um, your need for guarantees in life that everything is going to turn out OK, uh, so it's very important for us to identify the proper cognitions in order to challenge them properly. In ACT, um, the goal is basically not to give importance to the thought and just to determine what your values are, live your life according to your values. If you value friendships, family, career, education, leisure activities, um, volunteering, helping others, what integrity, honesty, whatever it may be, just lead your life accordingly. Cognitive therapy, on the other hand, the goal is to make you feel better by changing your thoughts. So feelings are um, preceded by thoughts. The idea is if we can change our thoughts, then we can change our feelings. Behavior change in act will occur or may not occur. The idea is obviously for it to occur spontaneously. Um, and in cognitive therapy, it's to change the uh, cognitions and therefore the emotions. Attentional training. Basically, um, in obsessions, you are internally focused whether it's a compulsion, you're thinking about something that's triggering that compulsion. So you're internally focused. And sometimes um, you may know that if you're internally focused, and it doesn't have to be an obsession, it could be just, you know, right now if you're thinking about, you know, what you're going to eat or, uh, you know, a phone call you have to make, you're not listening to what I'm saying, or you're not looking at the slides, um, you're not taking in the information. So we know that with people who have OCD, they're thinking a lot of the time, uh, and or they're engaging in some kind of ritual. So they're not really focusing on the environment. So what we want to do is change that focus from internal to external focus. So we want to teach the individual to not pay attention to the thoughts and pay attention to the task at hand. And there's a variety of um, exercises that we do to teach someone to refocus from the internal to the external world. In um, Task concentration skills, it's, it's basically concentrating on what is being said and or concentrate on the task at hand. So whether you're at work or whether you're cooking or whether you're um, speaking to someone else, uh, no matter what you're doing, pay attention to what you're doing. 
Again, some of the strategies is to become aware of the sounds, sights, um, colors in your environment. It involves mindfulness. It involves um, trying to uh, diffuse the thoughts, detach from the thoughts, um, and try to refocus into the uh, external world. So where do we go from here? Well, uh, we want to utilize new treatment modalities to deal, to deal with the obstacles. We need to find new ways to deal with our obstacles. We need to find more ways to get people to be willing to do the treatment, willing to engage in treatment. One of the things we could do is maybe start studying individuals who are willing and see what makes them willing and other people not willing. Uh, investigate strategies to decrease overvalued ideation. Improve our techniques and modalities for changing personality characteristics and personality disorders. Look at who benefits from intensive. Not only is intensive better than weekly, but also is there a subgroup of individuals who do better with intensive than with weekly? Are these individuals pure OCD, spectrum disordered individuals, or does it rely on the degree of impairment? So these are some of the new directions that might be helpful for us to address those 25% of the individuals who are not responding to CBT. Thank you. So it's with my great pleasure, we're now going to turn it over um, uh, to Alan Wegg, and it's sort of part two of the CBT um, uh, story. And to me, it's a great pleasure to have both OCD New York and OCD New Jersey here on the platform because I view us as right in the middle of them. So that's great. Please, Alan. Thanks, Blair. I didn't ask before, how many people are actually here from New Jersey? Oh, a few brave souls. Good for you. Um, one last plug I wanted to mention, uh, on the outside, we actually have, again, the brochures for this, a week from tomorrow, a presentation uh, for our annual conference, and it's uh, Dr. Barbara Van Noppen, who's out from uh, University of Southern California, is going to be talking about the role of the family in OCD. And so it really is apropos for a lot of you who are here, um, especially for other family members. And we also have, besides the presenter, um, it's a, like a buffet lunch in the whole bit. Um, but one of the other things that we have is we have a living with OCD panel, which are people who are up there to tell uh, very briefly their stories and, and then take questions in the audience. We have this year a 12-year-old, a couple of 14-year-olds, and a few adults. And it's always really an amazing experience. It's very warm. And um, it's a balance um, of people who have OCD, people who live with OCD, and people who work with OCD that are in the audience. So you never know who you're sitting next to, which is kind of evens the, leving, the levels the playing field and makes everybody feel kind of there for the same reason. It's very nice. So I encourage you to come. So please pick those up. How's everybody holding up? OK. A lot of information. I don't know about you, but my ears are bleeding out because it's just so much stuff on a Saturday morning. So I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm not actually going to be teaching you anything new that you haven't already heard or that you're probably already familiar with. What I focus on is the delivery system. How do you get all that information across in a different way? No, no graphs, no studies, no percentages, no numbers. I tell stories. And let me talk to you a little bit about how this all started. Um, I, um, I, uh, I, I worked for many years in a mental health center in central New Jersey. And because I identified myself as a cognitive behavioral therapist and most of the other psychologists and clinical social workers um, were more psychodynamic or family systems kind of therapists, for some reason they felt that I should get all the anxiety disorder patients that came to the clinic, or a, a lot of them. And I found myself, uh, while I was really fascinated and interested in all these cases, and I still work with all of them, that there was something about OCD. When people told me their stories or described their symptoms or what they thought about, there was something, um, while it was strangely bizarre and just at first hearing it, that's so weird, there was something also hauntingly familiar about the kinds of things that they were telling me. Like I could relate to even the most bizarre kind of things at some level. And that combination of it 
looking initially so psychotic, but yet being so kind of an every man's kind of struggle struck me to a great degree. And so I started specializing in the treatment. But um, as, uh, as I learned more and more about the therapy, I realized that it's really tough to sell the therapy because it's what we call counterintuitive. It doesn't really make sense at first glance. Um, I usually start by telling people, you think that your thoughts and your behaviors are weird and bizarre and strange? Well, just wait till you see what the therapy is all about. Because it's just more so. I've had situations, for instance, where um, these are all true. Uh, a very big, burly man, unshaven, uh, maybe close to 300 pounds, looks like a truck driver, is sitting on the couch next to me, holding a meat cleaver to my throat. As he says the words, I could just take this meat cleaver and slit your throat, and the blood would come pouring out, and you fall on the floor, gurgling sounds coming out of your mouth, lying in a pool of your own blood. I've had another a, a person, a 16-year-old girl, who was sitting on my couch holding a small amount of dirt with a worm, a live worm, wriggling around in it, saying out loud, the germs of that worm is seeping deep into my skin and going into my blood uh, system and is being transported all over to all the vital organs of my body over and over and over again. Um, I had a school teacher in a from a religious school who was sitting there reading what she had written, which is, I'll let you fill in the blank, F God over and over and over and over again. So I often think that if there was such a thing as therapy, therapy police and they burst into my office, I would be the person that they took away, not the, not the client on the couch, because it looks and sounds really crazy. And one of the things I also noticed is that when I went to most presentations about OCD and read books about OCD, almost invariably, people use metaphors and stories to try to get some of these ideas across, just in the course of, um, uh, of trying to make a point or illustrate a concept. And uh, I found that very intriguing because no one had actually really focused on the, the idea of using metaphors and stories as a main thing to focus on. So I found myself when I was talking with people coming up with a story or a metaphor and saying, that's really good. I'm going to use that again and, and write it down. And then I would do that over and over again. And then at a certain point, I had like 60 of these stories and metaphors. And I wrote this book. And that's my shtick. That's what I do. That's my contribution to the field. I'm not really, again, offering new information. But I'm, uh, I'm asking people to think about the information in a different way. And um, it works in different, in, for different people, whether you're talking about a family member, someone with OCD, or uh, the therapist de uh, delivering the treatment. Um, uh, there are certain advantages to that. So let me get started. Uh, a lot of these are autobiographical. <laughs> in fact, when I had the book published, um, they, they sent it back to me, and they said, this is too much about you. You've got to make it more generic. So I had to rewrite the book because it was just too much about me. And the truth of the matter is I like that it's about me because this way, um, when I tell the story, I can say I really get it because this is what I've experienced. So I'm going to start the first couple of these stories are autobiographical, and they're true, and then I'll, get an, I'll mix it up a little bit. So let me start with the first one. Now, you heard a few again talking about obsessions and compulsions, and you all know what this is. But uh, the story that I tell for an obsession is a true story. I, uh, was, um, I grew up in Queens, so I'm a neighbor. And uh, when I was, uh, I guess, 16 years old, I took driver's education, you know, with the big embarrassing student driver's sign on the top, and you have a very nervous um, instructor in the death seat, and then you have three students in the back and one person who's driving, and you switch you switch around all the time in terms of who's driving. And it was my turn, and it was only the second time we had gone out on the road, and he already wanted me to go out on the Grand Central Parkway, which I don't have to explain here because I'm not in Jersey. I usually say it's like the Garden State Parkway because people don't know. And so it's a big highway. And I'm on you know, the granny lane, the slow lane. He makes me go into the sandwich lane, the middle lane. And then he gets me to go into the, the hammer lane, the fast lane. 
which I was very hesitant to do. And he's pushing me to go faster and faster because he wants me to go, what at that time, I don't know what it is now, 55 miles an hour. And so I'm going really fast, white knuckling it with my hands at the standard 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock positions like you're supposed to have. And the thought occurs to me, I could just go like this. And everybody in the car and maybe people around us would instantly die. Now, in retrospect, when I think about this, it makes sense that I would have such a worry at that time because up until that point in my life, I'd never been in a situation where a single body movement would result in such immediate catastrophic consequences. So anyway, I had that thought and I start getting like a panic attack, you know? I'm in a full-blown panic attack. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then I, I pulled it together and I said, no, wait a minute. I don't typically do things that are you know, out of control with my arms. I mean, if I don't want to do this, I don't do this. And I also looked around and I saw all the other people driving and I said to myself, well, they're not doing it. I'm no more crazy or weird or out of control than they are. I'm sure that I'll be fine. And I was able to let that go and just drive. The obsession that I have is very much like the obsession that someone with OCD has. The only difference is it doesn't stick with me. It sticks with them. But the idea of having really crazy, weird thoughts of any kind, that's a perfectly normal thing. And why I think this is very important to share with people early on in therapy is because a lot of people come into the treatment feeling really crazy and out of control. And they're scared. And what I try to do is sort of normalize stuff a little bit, depathologize stuff a little bit, and say, it really isn't the thoughts that are crazy. I mean, the problem is you don't trust to let them go, and they stick in your head. You get, they get caught in this cycle, which we've talked about. Um, but the thoughts themselves are not crazy, and those are the things that people really get scared about. Oh, I forgot to show you. There I am. <laughs> Actually, when this was drawn, I really had a lot more hair. Now it's pretty appropriate. All right. The other side is the compulsion. Another true story. I'm in graduate school. By the way, when I wrote these stories, I, I realized <laughs> that 90% of my stories begin with when I was in graduate school. <laughs> and I realized that's because so many decades were spent in graduate school. So I, um, um, I, I, one of my uh, stress response patterns, one of the things that happened to me when I get really anxious is I forget things, I misplace things. If I'm in the office and I'm on my fifth pen because I keep losing them, um, that usually means I'm having a very harried day. Um, and so what ended up happening is uh, it was during finals week and I locked myself out of my car in the parking lot of a mall twice in one week, two different days. Uh, I remember feeling really surprised that the police could just go over and with a little tiny tin thing, they could just go boom, 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 and they open up the car. But this is a long time ago when we didn't have remotes. And so what you had to do, for those of you who are under a certain age, I'll explain. What you had to do is you had to push the button down to lock the door and then hold up the handle of the door. And while you held it, you had to close the door and then let go, and that would lock it. That's to prevent you from locking yourself out. It didn't work with me for those two times because I locked myself out anyway. The keys were in the car. So I got, uh, I, got out of the, you know, I got out of that situation with the help of the police, and what ended up happening was I found myself doing this very interesting thing. And that is whenever I was ready to lock the door, I, held, you know, I pushed the button down and I held the door handle up, and then I took the keys, which were in my other hand, and I squeezed them so hard that I, they almost hurt my hand, and I had to say the word keys so I could hear myself say it. That's a checking behavior. It's no different than someone with OCD, except it took me three seconds, so it wasn't a big deal. It didn't interfere with my functioning. It didn't cause distress. And so by definition, it wasn't OCD. In fact, you know, you should be aware of the fact that the International OCD Foundation until recently was just called o the OC Foundation. And one of the reasons why they changed their name is because OC Foundation didn't really capture what this organization is really all about, which is lots of people have obsessions and compulsions. This is about having obsessive compulsive disorder, where this stuff really gets in the way. It causes emotional pain. It causes difficulty with functioning. And so, again, the idea that people get obsessions, oh, here we are, that people get obsessions and people engage in compulsions is an everyday thing with pretty much everybody. Again, normal, normalizing, depathologizing. And also what it does is just, you can see how it helps to explain what an obsession is and what a compulsion is. Um, you'll see as I talk about all these things, what this does is it allows the person to get a picture 
a story that is associated with different ideas and concepts when it comes to uh, defining the disorder and then the treatment of the disorder. It's a shorthand. I'll review that with you towards the end. All right, the next three stories really focus on the concept of exposure therapy, which you just re reviewed with, with Fugan. And so um, this, is, uh, this is how these three stories go. First story is really not really a story, it's kind of a metaphor. When you're in your backyard and you are having guests and you don't want them to be, to be bothered by bees, one of the things you can do is you can buy or make a bee trap. A bee trap is, if you made it yourself, uh, a device where you go to the store and you buy one of those big three liter bottles of soda, not the kind that are brown tinted or green tinted, but the clear ones. You empty out the soda when you bring it home and you take the label off so you have a big, long, clear plastic bottle. Got the picture? You take some honey, you pour it right down the top spout, it goes straight down and forms a little puddle at the bottom of this clear plastic bottle. Um, you then, uh, when it dries, you then turn the bottle upside down and you take a wire or an open paper clip and you tape that to what is now the top of the bottle so you can hang it upside down in the backyard. But there's one more thing you have to do before it works properly. You have to take black electrician's tape, the kind of tape they use on wires, and about two-thirds of the way down on the bottle is you wrap that black tape around and around and around, past the opening, and you cut it so there's a little small opening at the bottom, and you hang that out. A bee enters the yard. It doesn't smell, it doesn't have a nose, but it can detect the scent of the honey, and it follows that scent up through the bottom of the bottle, goes inside and up to the roof. There it is. Um, and uh, even though the, the honey is dry, it can extract certain things from the honey. And when a bee is ready to go back to the hive, it's programmed that when it's inside something, like a hollow tree trunk or a cave, that the way out is where the light is. But the way this thing is set up, there's just light everywhere. And so the bee tries to get out, and it slams its body against the plastic because the bee doesn't get the concept of plastic. Why doesn't the bee just fly down towards the bottom and go out the way that it came in? Any guesses? The black tape blocks out the light. It's darker at the bottom. So when it flies, whenever it happens to fly down towards the bottom, it feels like it's going in the wrong direction. It feels like it's going deeper into something. So it flies back up because that kind of makes sense. If you're a bee, light is where you go out. But it doesn't work. It's logical, but it doesn't work. The only way to get free of the trap is to fly in what feels like the wrong direction. It feels like you're flying into something, but you're actually flying out of something. That's the metaphor for exposure therapy in OCD. When we are exposed to something that makes us feel anxious, we are hardwired as a species to hide from it, to run from it, to protect ourselves. It's how we survived. Everything that you do in exposure therapy is exactly the opposite of that. And so you're asking someone to expose themselves to something, to move towards something that they want to run away from, to engage with something that they're afraid of. It goes against our, our fiber of who we are as animals. It's tough. But the concept of why would I, you know, because people come to you and what do they want? They want to feel less anxious. And I tell them, well, the therapy is we're going to do things that's going to make you more anxious. So what do they do with that? This concept explains in some ways how counterintuitive treatment works. Now, there are rules about exposure therapy, so let's talk about a couple of those. Um, uh, Marla and I are friends, and uh, she uh, calls me up, and she says to me, Alan, let's go to the movies. And I'm so excited that Marla asks me to go to the movies with her that I don't ask her, what movie are we going to? I don't care. I'm going to go out with Marla. It's going to be great. We're going to have a fun time. And so we go to the movies, and we're walking, and we're talking, and I pay for the tickets, and I don't pay attention to what movie we're going to see. She made the choice, and we just go in. We go into the lobby. We go sit down in the theater, and the movie starts. And uh, the movie is Friday the 13th, part 720, whatever number they're up to these days. Um, it's one of those adolescent horror kinds of uh, flicks. And um, in the story that I'm telling you, Marla loves these kind of movies. I hate these kind of movies. So the first scene comes up, and it's something horrific. I get freaked out. 
I run out of the movie theater. We call that an escape response. lowers my anxiety a little bit. And it's going to be very hard for me to get back into that movie theater. In fact, if I was really traumatized enough, you may have a hard time getting me to go to that movie theater even to see another movie. I might even feel anxious driving down the street in front of that movie theater if I was traumatized enough because of generalization. But let's say she knows my weakness and she says, Alan, I know that they're selling in that lobby those big buckets of, extra, of popcorn with extra butter, and I will buy you one of those if you come with me to watch the movie. So I'm a pig. I say yes. <laughs> and um, I, I, don't, I don't close my eyes. I really watch the movie from beginning to end. That's me. And I experience, you know, the full-blown plant panic. You know, my heart is racing. I'm hyperventilating. I'm shaking. I'm sweating. I feel like I want to go to the bathroom. I feel like I'm going to faint. I'm just a mess. I feel like I'm going to throw up. It's an awful situation, but I watch the whole movie. And then Marla bats her eyes at me, and she says at the end of the movie, that was really such a great movie, Alan. Can we sit through it another time? And I said, no way. I am almost dying here. This is terrible. And then she whips out one of those big chocolate-covered raisinette boxes that cost 150 bucks at the front. And uh, I sit and I watch that with her a second time. And then somehow she gets me to watch with something else that she had in her pocket a third time. So we have a marathon of watching this horror movie, three days in a row, sitting in the same seats all afternoon. I go home. The next day she calls me up. And she says, Alan, let's get together. I say, sure, what do you want to do? She says, let's go to the movies. I say, what movie? And she says, the one we went to yesterday, I really want to see it again. And somehow she gets me to go and we watch it again and again and again. Third day, same exact thing. We watch it again and again and again. Three more times, paying attention. How many times have I watched the movie with Marla? Nine, thank you very much. Four-day weekend. So she calls me up and we watch it again three more times. So now we've watched it together how many times? 12 times. My question for you is, when I watch that movie for the 12th time with Marla, do I react the same way as I did the first time I, I watched the movie with Marla? And the answer is no. And I want you to answer this as if you're not a mental health professional or someone who knows anything about OCD and its treatment. So no fancy words. Why? I got used to it. There's always some smart article that says desensitization, no matter how many times I focus on that. So thank you very much. I got used to it. I know what I'm going to expect. It doesn't bother me anymore. I may not like it like Marla, but I don't get this visceral reaction anymore. We call that desensitization. The word sensitive isn't there, or habituation. The word habit isn't there. It becomes like a habit. And that's at the heart of how OCD exposure works. Now, people hear these stories, these first two stories about exposure. And they'll say, okay, I understand that if um, I fly into the darkness like the bee trap and I face my fears and if I keep doing it over and over and over again, because that's really the key, doing it over and over and over again, um, or staying there for a long period of time, that I actually end up learning because of desensitization and habituation not to have this anxiety reaction. But I am not interested. Why? because I don't want to feel like you felt the first time. That feels too scary and too overwhelming for me. That's just going to be too much. It's going to push me over the edge. So I get the idea, not interested. That's why we have the third story. Short story. Very, very hot summer day. Very, very cold, unheated, in-ground swimming pool. There are two strategies for entering the swimming pool. One is the running cannonball dive, where you throw your body off the deep end of the pool. You tuck your knees into your chest. You make yourself into a big ball. You slam all at once into the ice-cold water. You scream your guts out for about 30 seconds, and then you pretty quickly get used to it. What's the alternative? What's the other way to go into the pool? You go in slow. There we are. You go in. Your toes get used to it. Your feet get used to it. Um, first of all, Two main differences about this versus the other way. Uh, when you go over the pool, once you're, once you're airborne, it's over. You're going down to this cold pool here. Because you're going in slowly, you have a lot more control over the process. And one of the things about having an anxiety disorder of any kind is you feel very much out of control. And so it's very important that clients feel in control of the process of therapy. And because especially they're flying into the darkness and facing fears, and so they're getting anxious, it's very easy to feel that sense of not being in control 
uh, at that point. And so what you want to do is have them learn how to do this therapy in small bits and pieces that they themselves determine with you so they have that sense of control. They're going to do much more and much more quickly if, if you do it that way, and they'll progress through the process. Um, and you also, you know, it's, it's a matter of imbuing trust in you over a period of time by practicing like this. The other thing, of course, is that you're not getting so much of a shock to the system. It may be uncomfortable, but it's your feet and then your legs and then your belly and then your shoulders and one piece at a time. So it spreads out over a longer period of time, but it also spreads out the intensity of the exposure. And so that's what exposure therapy is. Flying into the darkness, the concept of needing to do it over and over and over again for long periods of time so you get that desensitization. But when you do it, you can do it in a hierarchical and in, in steps, in a hierarchy fashion. I want to talk a little bit more about hierarchy and this whole concept of doing things one step at a time. Another true story about me. So I lived here in Queens. I lived in Jackson Heights. Anybody from Jackson Heights? Really? Yay! I lived in Jackson Heights, and I went to a dentist, and um, I got to a certain age where the focus was not so much on cavity prevention, but it was really on flossing and uh, gum care, because at, you know once you become like an early adolescent, they changed the focus, or at least they did then. And every single time I went to the dentist, like every six months, and Dr. Devac would give me this, uh, you know, those little tins with the, the floss in it. And he'd say, Alan, you really have to be flossing like every single day. It's really very important. And he told me all these things. And he showed me all these pictures. And he scared the crap out of me. And I said, OK, OK, OK. I'm going to do this. So I'd go home. And I would take the thing out. And I'd look in the mirror. And I'd start playing with it. And my elbows kept getting in the way. And it was a lot of work. And it took me like 15 minutes to do like three teeth. I said, forget this. I'm not doing this. <laughs> and so uh, I didn't do it until the next time I went to the dentist. And he did the same thing again. And we played it through. And each time, I would like do. A, 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 an eighth of my mouth one day and then didn't do another thing for six months. So I came to Queens, I came to New Jersey, and um, I started with a new dentist. And I told him this story that I just told you. And what he said to me was, okay, Alan, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go home, give me the same little tin. Actually, give me a few tins, because he was very optimistic, I guess. He gave me a few tins, and he said to me, oh, I want you to go home, and I want you to do flossing for 60 seconds. I don't care if you do one tooth. Just do 60 seconds. And I said, OK, I could do that. And I did 60 seconds. And the next day, I did 60 seconds. And the next day, I did 60 seconds. By the fourth day, I think it was, I was noticing I was getting a little bit better about handling my elbows. They weren't getting in the way so much. And I ended up doing about a quarter of my mouth. And I said, well, I can, I can do four minutes. I can handle that. And then, of course, over a period of just a few days after that, I was able to do really my whole mouth in you know, two minutes or, or less. And I've been flossing every day since then. I have very nice teeth. Thank you very much. The idea is, as long as I tried to take on too much, I got overwhelmed and I said, I'm out of here. But once I just started taking small steps, and I was reinforced because I felt like I could do this, then I was able to build on that. I built the sense of what we call self-efficacy. I can do this. Self-esteem is how I feel about me. Self-efficacy is how I feel about my ability to do something. And it was that, that was the trick that allowed me to move forward. So the hierarchy is, you know, is really very important for lots of reasons. This one really emphasizes, oh, sorry, I keep forgetting to do that. There I am. Um, uh, what story emphasizes is this idea that, uh, that if you take just small steps, you know, you can move forward and you can trust yourself that you're able to. I'm watching the time. How are we doing with time? Okay, I have till 5 of 12. So you think I've been talking fast up till now. Just you wait. <laughs> I'm a New York Jew. I can go past the... <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. So, um... You know, one of the things that we do a lot with uh, the treatment, especially when we work with kids, but really with adults too, is this whole idea of anthropomorphizing the OCD. We, when with kids, we, we have kids draw pictures of the OCD. They give it a name. It's this whole idea of separating. There's you, and then there's the OCD. And this is a way of struggling with the OCD. And we talk a lot about the relationship that you have with the OCD. And if you think about the OCD as being an enemy whose um, goal is to control you through intimidation, with kids we call it the bully, Everything that a person experiences when they have OCD really makes a lot more sense. So once you accept that premise, it really helps a lot in terms of dealing with a lot of what's going on. So I'll give you a, uh, this story that I, that's just a made-up story about what I call statue on the mantelpiece as a way of thinking about how you deal with this bully. So I'm sitting at home, again, made-up story. Guy knocks on the door. 
He walks into, he's my neighbor. He, I let him in. He walks into my house. He walks over to my fireplace. My fireplace has a mantelpiece, you know, the shelf right over the fireplace. And on the fireplace mantelpiece, there's a little glass statue that I like. So my neighbor goes over and he knows that I like it. He picks up the glass statue, holds it over his head. He says, give me $10. I'm going to smash the statue into 100 pieces on the floor. Not a very nice neighbor. So I want the statue. So I gave him $10 and he puts it down and he leaves. And the next day comes, he knocks on the door again. I let him in. And he walks over again. He picks up the glass statue, holds it over his head. Please give me $10. Or I'm going to smash this into 100 pieces. So I give him $10. He puts it down. He leaves. This happens after day after day after day. I'm starting to get really very angry. And I'm running out of money. And the kids always say that I tell the story. They always say, well, why, do you, why do you let him in? Call the police. Do something else. Hide the statue. It's not part of the story. So I, um, I let him in. I see that it's him. And before he can go over to the statue, I run over to the statue. I grab the statue. I grab it, and I throw it on the ground, and I break it into 100 pieces. And I say to him, there, now what are you going to do? <laughs> now, what I did was the unexpected, because he and I were dancing this dance. He intimidates me. I give into it. It's like the bully in the playground who asks for a quarter, or I'll beat you up. It's the same idea. And as long as I keep doing what he wants me to do, he's going to keep coming back and wanting more and more and more from me. And so what I'm doing is I'm stepping outside of the box. I'm doing something unexpected. I pulled out the rug from under him. I took out the wind from his sails, you know, whatever metaphor you want to use. I did what he didn't expect me to do. And that's the way we talk about thinking about dealing with OCD. Um, there it is. True story, I was, I was in Albuquerque with my family and we're climbing up this mountain and at the top of the mountain. There is this visitor's place where they have lunch and you, know, you can buy t-shirts and stuff. And there was a sign that said, if you see a mountain lion, this is what you should do. Well, I wanted to go over and see, you know, I wanted to see this because I'm from Queens. What do I know about mountain lions? <laughs> I figured you call the mountain lion, you know, you call the mountain lion police on your cell phone or something like that. I didn't know what. So um, the truth is, I thought that if you see a mountain lion, you know, you don't run, you stand still and you're quiet. Not true. Because whether you run away or you stand still, you're acting like a prey. And if you act like a prey, that animal's going to act like a predator. What you're supposed to do is you grab a stick that's around and you start slamming it against whatever tree you can find and you jump up and down and you yell and you scream and if you have a coat or a jacket, you go like this because it makes you look bigger. I didn't think mountain lions were so stupid, but that make you look, it makes you look bigger. And because you're acting like another predator, it will more likely walk away and leave you. The relationship that people usually have with OCD before they come into therapy is their prey and the OCD is the predator. And everything they do, whether it's avoiding or engaging in a ritual, is, is an attempt to try to hide or get around or run away from whatever it is the OCD is challenging them with. This is about taking a very aggressive stance. It's about saying, I'm going to challenge you back. And I really like that because it's very empowering. What are we doing? Um, a very quick one, oh, there's that. Uh, for parents, where do I begin? You're on a flight, you're getting ready to take off, they go over all that stuff you're supposed to go, go over, you know, the flight attendants, what's one of the first things they tell you, what's one of the things they tell you to do is if those oxygen masks fall down and you're with someone who can't be helped or can't help themselves as much, which is usually a small child, you put the mask on yourself first and then you take care of the child because you can end up passing out and then that kid's in trouble. And so this whole idea of taking care of yourself first is very important, which is why when families come in to deal with OCD and they're wrapped up in the web of OCD and they're dancing all these dances and, and, and they're not allowed to say this and not allowed to go here and they're not allowed to do this in this particular way, they're caught up just like in, in, in an alcoholic family, they're all caught up in the system of OCD, then one of the first things we try to do is disengage them because they're not going to be any help at all if they're contributing to the whole problem, if they're doing a lot of reassurance, if they're serving, you know, serving the kid um, meals in the living room because they can't come into the kitchen and on and on and on and on. Okay, so those are just a few sprinklings of some of the stories that we utilize to try to get certain kinds of points across. I'm just going to read what's up here so you can kind of digest how we use this. The therapist and the person with OCD now have a sort of shorthand which can be used to think about or talk about OCD. For persons with OCD, you understand that the paradoxical treatment of exposure and response prevention involves flying into the darkness. 
and that while you have to repeatedly go to a horror movie in order to ensure your recovery, you can still control at what end and how quickly you enter into a swimming pool. You know you have to behave as a predator rather than a prey, and that you should challenge your OCD in an unconventional way by breaking the statue on the mantelpiece. When you become afraid because you tell yourself that treatment will be too hard and you will get overwhelmed, you're not going to remind yourself to take on your challenges one step at a time, like flossing. Thus, for the person with OCD, by making references to these stories, you can share with others and they can support you in a way that will help you feel less isolated and more understood. It's a way for you to communicate to other people. For therapists, you, know how you now have not only a better insider's viewpoint into the world of OCD, a phenomenological understanding of the inner life of the OCD-afflicted person, but you have tools which you can use to remind that person that you stand by them. You can engender a greater level of trust that comes from a sharing a personal language, a private memory, a common experience. We should expect that this trust ultimately leads to him or her more easily finding the courage to better fly into the darkness as in the bee trap. You need not limit yourself to these stories. Rather, view them as prototypes or illustrations of how you can develop and utilize your own stories for the purpose of better communicating your understanding of the experience and treatment of OCD. The stories shared here can serve as a solid foundation onto which you can build, providing narratives from your own personal experience or imagination. Um, you might have handouts, I know that there, these are just different resources. That's it, thank you very much. Okay, that's great, thank you, Alan. And last but not least for the morning session is Wayne. So Wayne Goodman, please, from Mount Sinai. Thank you, Dr. Simpson. That, that's uh, gonna be a hard act to follow. Especially, you're, you're probably getting hungry by now. I'm going to be talking about something completely different. The subject matter is OCD, but we're, we're going to be talking about um, neuromodulation. By neuromodulation, I'm referring to the use of uh, various devices to treat OCD, and I'm going to be focusing primarily on deep brain stimulation, uh, which is a neurosurgical approach. And you've heard a little bit already today about treatment-resistant OCD, although we, we, we can do very well with some of our standard treatments, uh, the SRIs, uh, behavior therapy, and there are various things we can do in between. Unfortunately, there are some patients that despite our best efforts, the best therapists, the best pharmacotherapists, uh, they continue to suffer from debilitating symptoms. And I've, I've never said to a patient with OCD that there was nothing left for them. I've never in my entire career. I can always think of something and, uh, and that there's always some other combination and there's always something on the horizon. So I, I, I'm always optimistic that we can try something. But at some point with some patients, they say that, you know, I, 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 it's so debilitating that I can't see myself going through another medication trial you know, I, I just, I, I want to try something very different. And they're, and I'm, I'm also very concerned about how they're doing. And uh, in those cases, over the years, even before deep, deep brain stimulation was available, I, I would feel duty sometimes to say, well, there's one other thing that you might want to consider, and that, that's a surgical approach. And I can only think before I did, was involved with deep brain stimulation of five cases in which I made that suggestion. And I, I was really reluctant about it because what I didn't like about uh, the surgical approaches, so by that I mean what, what we call ablative surgery, which is actually producing a, a lesion in the brain. I didn't like that, and I still don't, because that mean, that's irreversible. One of the things that physicians are trained not to do is to, is to do things that you can't reverse. So, but there were a few cases, and I can think back where it was life-saving. I remember one, one patient who said that, you know, I, and, and that, that I, I just, I, I can't go on with this OCD any longer, and by a certain, certain date, if I'm not better, that's the end. And I was convinced he was very serious. So I said, you need to go to England, which was at that time one of the best places for surgery, sent him off there, and I wouldn't say it cured his OCD, it certainly didn't, but he wasn't suicidal after that, it made enough of a difference for him to continue to persevere. 
So that, that's sort of the background. So we're, we're not, we're, when we're talking about deep brain stimulation, when I'm talking about deep brain stimulation, we're talking about a very narrow group of patients. Uh, the, the criteria for the different studies that, that, that I'll tell you about, uh, that, 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 some, uh, that are still ongoing, vary. But for the most part, we're talking about deep brain stimulation. I, well, it is still an experimental procedure. Even though the FDA uh, has a partial indication under what's called a human device exemption for OCD in the same way they do for uh, dystonia, it's still experimental. This uh, deep brain stimulation is still an unproven treatment. It's promising, yes. Um, it's as safe as performing surgery for refractory Parkinson's disease. But it is, it's got potentially serious complications, particularly during the surgery itself. Patients that, that, want, uh, that are eligible, that, that may want to consider a DBS, are, are those that have failed multiple medication trials, at the minimum several different SSRI trials, augmentation trials, always include clomipramine, because as, as Dr. Poscar was saying earlier, the, some patients do do better on clomipramine, we still don't understand why, than the SSRIs, and they must have failed CBT, and, and we, we make sure that the CBT they've had has been an adequate trial in the right hands. And we have a very, inf uh, all, all the places that do it hopefully have a ro robust informed consent process where we not only make sure that the person understands the possible risks of the, of the procedure, but also the alternatives. And as I said, there are always alternatives. Um, my own person, what's my own personal experience with DBS and OCD? It's still, it's still rather limited, but it's probably more than most people, um, uh, most physicians. Uh, I was involved with six patients at the University of Florida and, and, and another seven at Mount Sinai. So a total of 13 patients. I've been in the operating room with all those patients, and I've done the programming. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot, but you, you, you get pretty I get pretty close to all my patients, but particularly to my patients who are having DBS, because it's, there's something very unique about what you're doing. When, when I see patients, when I'm doing the programming, after they've had their surgery, I'm interacting with the person, but I'm also interacting directly with their brains. And I'll, I'll explain how that happens. Uh, we could say we're always interacting with their brains, but this is kind of short circuits in a, in a way. Uh, wh why would we even consider deep brain stimulation, and why, did it, why would you consider uh, neurosurgical approaches uh, at all? It has to do with the gravity of the illness, its treatment-resistant nature, uh, the paucity of effective alternative treatments. So we're, we're heard, e although the, in, in the case of depression, there, there are various antidepressants and ECT, which sometimes work. Th those treatments often don't work in ECT. And sporadically, the, there were cases and case series in the literature of neurosurgeons, whether at Mass General Hospital, the Karolinska in Stockholm, of taking patients who have failed everything else and felt they had no other options, of looking like the surgery really helped them. I mean, there, there was skeptic, we, we still, we, we have the, the quality of the data really varied. These weren't sham controlled. Sometimes we didn't really know exactly how they were doing before the surgery. But there, there is a story out there, if you read the literature, that is really suggestive that sometimes uh, uh, the surgery of this uh, really made a, a huge difference in a person's life. And uh, it happens to be a convergence. It's almost an accidental convergence between the targets that some of the neurosurgeons selected to do surgery and treatment-resistant OCD and some of the circuitry models that have developed over the years, mostly informed by functional brain imaging studies. There is actually a convergence of where what either those lesions were placed or where we're placing the electrodes of deep brain stimulation and the evidence we have about where, what the circuitry is that mediates the symptoms of OCD. And uh, we heard earlier from Dr. Simpson uh, as she delineated a circuit that one way of conceptualizing this pattern of obsessions and compulsions and the compulsions feeding the obsessions, that over time you can imagine that these connections become stronger, uh, they're self-reinforcing, and at some point, bec partly because they involve brain structures that are somewhat out of conscious control, some of these deeper subcortical structures involving the, the striatum, that you can imagine, that even though somebody has tremendous insight into why they shouldn't be doing it, it's already been so ingrained 
that it's very hard just consciously to stop it. So the notion for, some, for the surgery, particularly ablative surgery, and initially with DBS, we were thinking that what, what's really going to happen here, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna find a node somewhere in that circuit, and we're going to interrupt it. We're going to do what people have not been able to do with, what we've, uh, with a cognitive therapy, what we've not been able to do with the medications. We're going to interrupt that circuit, and we're going to relieve them of some of their symptoms. That, that's kind of the conceptualization. And I'm not sure it's true anymore, but it's, it's, it's an interesting... Uh, that, that's what really kind of draw, uh, drove a lot of the, the early work. Now, when we talk about where in the brain, one, one, of the, one of the targets, and the one that I'm going to talk about in the brain, is an area of the brain called the anterior limb of the internal capsule. This is an area in the brain in, which you can imagine as kind of a superhighway, uh, or, or maybe even better, a conduit. Imagine that the neurons are wires, and they're coming from very different places and going very different places, and, but they're all converging in this narrow path, this conduit, they're close together, passing through the anterior limb of the internal capsule. And that's largely what you have there, is you have all these wires, or you have the superhighway, whatever metaphor you prefer. And so that there's an opportunity by go, picking that spot to, uh, in, in, uh, to identify uh, a circuit or interrupt a circuit between one region of the brain and the other. And uh, let me see if I can do it with a pointer here. Can you see that on here? Good. Um, it, so some of the work started with producing a lesion where the, the surgeon would put in a, a wire inside the brain and heat it up and, and it destroys a little bit of tissue. Um, and the, another procedure that's still, still being done, particularly a, a Butler Hospital, Brown University, they're still doing this procedure. It's called cap, gamma capsulotomy. It, the end result is still producing a lesion. And by lesion, I mean you, you're permanently destroying a small amount of uh, uh, brain tissue. Um, but you, you do it without performing a cradionomy. So you do it with radiation, and the way, way it works is this is a technique that was developed for cancer therapy. So if you had a deep-seated tumor, you could, you could focus all these different sources of radiation at, the, so, at a focal point the same way you would with a magnifying glass and the sun's beams, and you, and you don't destroy any intervening tissue. You don't have to create uh, a, an opening in the skull. Uh, but in the end, it, I, this is still an invasive process. It's leading to permanent loss of, of brain tissue. What's important in part about this is it's helped identify where the lesion should be. And what, what they found at Brown is that it was the lesions that were placed a little deeper in the brain that seemed to produce the best results in reducing OCD symptoms. And that became the initial target for placing uh, the leads for deep brain stimulation. And here down, this is what this is. And you can also actually see... If you look at this section through the brain, this is all the anterior limb of the internal capsule. Again, this is the superhighway here. But as uh, experience has grown with both the uh, lesion therapy and DBS, the target has kind of migrated a little bit more to an area that, that seems to produce better results. And this shows where you would place the electrodes for uh, deep brain stimulation. So what, what do I, again, let me just reinforce what I mean but between ablative or, 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 or DBS. By ablative, uh, you're intentionally destroying some brain tissue. Uh, DBS, that is not your intention. And if all goes well, at least with, from a safety standpoint, uh, I no longer look at DBS as a last resort. I used to say, you know, that DBS is the last resort. Uh, I, don't, I don't see it that way anymore because, uh, uh, if all, again, if all goes well, let's say, but they don't get better, which can happen. Not everybody gets better with DBS. Say a year or so later, the patient can elect to have the uh, hardware explanted. And hopefully there hasn't been any long-term damage and we, we can start over with some, a new approach. Uh, uh, so by definition, because you're producing uh, tissue destruction, this is not reversible. DBS uh, uh, is reversible, uh, we, we hope, and as long as there's no complications. And a really important aspect to me is that it's adjustable. And, and I'll explain a little bit more what I mean. It's because, in fact, as much as we, we, we think we know about the circuitry o OCD, there's a lot more to learn. And we're not exactly sure uh, where to place these lesions or which is the circuit that's primarily responsible for OCD symptoms. So I, I like the idea is that I can make some adjustments even after the surgery has taken place. 
This is a, a cartoon, an inaccurate one, of what deep brain stimulation looks like. The wires don't hang outside the, the head. They're, they're tunneled by the, by the uh, surgeon. Make no mistake, this is brain surgery. And some of my patients, that this, well, I don't want to confuse, well, another thing I'll talk about very briefly at the end is something that's non-invasive called TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. That, it does not involve surgery. It does, uh, that, that, but here, when we're talking about deep brain stimulation, as the word deep implies, where the, 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 uh, the involves a neurosurgeon, the psychiatrist does not do the procedure, thank goodness. It's not, uh, uh, and uh, there's an electrode, believe it or not, permanently implanted in, in the brain. The wire's tunneled under the skin, and it's connected to a computer and a battery that's very much like a cardiac pacemaker. In fact, the original ones were made by the same company, Medtronic, that introduced the first cardiac pacemakers. It's placed in the chest. It's done on both sides. We call this bilateral. And it's under the skin. So, so you get a little pot, they create a little pocket under the skin. And then, well, I'm, I'm not going to show a little bit out of order, but let me tell you where, the, where uh, DBS is from the standpoint of the Food and Drug Administration. It's actually to the, these surgeons that do this type of surgery, a very routine surgery. Some of these, that's, uh, there have been over 75,000 surgeries like this performed, not for OCD, but for movement disorders, in particular. Uh, refractory Parkinson's disease and also essential tremor. And it has this limited approval, it's called the humanitarian device exemption, uh, for dystonia and for OCD starting in 2010. This is, uh, uh, there are different types of electrodes, but th this is the one that I've had the most experience with. Uh, the one, the, there's one, um, partic we're participating in a study that's led by uh, Ben Greenberg at Brown, and actually the, the lecturer we're using that NIMH-funded study uh, has the same number of electrodes, but they're more closely spaced. This is the one we've used, and uh, this electrode, again, is implanted in the brain, and then there are these four contacts that can be activated. And uh, once, once, the, once, once, even if it's placed, it's, it's held in place, it's, you, know, you, you don't want it to move, uh, you can adjust remotely through a wireless uh, a device that I'll show you a picture of in a moment, which of these contacts is active. So it's almost like moving the contacts you know, without having to move them. I can, I can activate which ones are on. I can put a combination of them on, so, and I can adjust the, the, the field strength, and I can change the frequency of the field. So there are almost too many, so many parameters that... that uh, it takes a very long time to optimize the settings for a particular person. And this is, so this would be, this is, uh, this is what I might be doing in the office or starting two weeks after the procedure. I have this device. The patient is placing the, a, uh, the head of the device over, uh, the head of the programmer over their implanted pulse generator inside their chest. And I'm making, uh, seeing, making sure everything is working, and I'm changing all those parameters I just mentioned, and doing it on both sides. And I'm saying, like I would in a therapy session, how do you feel? But and in some cases, and, and I'm observing the person, and you can see some acute effects, and we, and we even see some effects in in the in the operating room. And one of the things I didn't mention is the patient's actually awake during the procedure, uh, at least for for the uh, neurosurgery part of it. Uh, the, the surgeon anesthetizes the scalp. The brain doesn't have any pain fibers. So after you get past the, the skull, pretty much, there, there's, no, there, there's no sensation of pain as the electrode is advanced. And you want the patient to be awake because you want to, one, you want to make sure everything is working. And sometimes we, we, we and it's actually been one case in which we, didn't get, we weren't getting the results we liked in the operating room, and the surgeon went back and, and moved it a little bit, and that made a huge difference. This is a little hard to follow, but this is a 3D reconstruction. This is a paper, a review paper that I published about DBS and psychiatric conditions uh, last year. And uh, this you can imagine, this is a plane of somebody's brain taken this way. And above that plane are some of these structures we've been talking about, including the anterior limb and the internal capsule. And you can see their picture, there are these fibers. So you have this electro kind of going down. You know, along the length of these fibers, and you can see that depending upon 
which of these contacts, which of these electrical contacts you stimulate, you may be stimulating very different fibers with very different origins and des destinations. So very, di very different parts of the circuit uh, depending upon uh, what parameters you're set. And this is the, where this, the, nucle uh, this is the caudate nucleus, the putamen, globus pallidus, an area called the striatum, which you heard about earlier. And the tip is an area called the nucleus accumbens. And, and if you look at the literature, any of you who have looked at the literature, you hear all these different names, but they're pretty much the same thing. So nucleus accumbens, anterior limb, internal capsule, ventral capsule, ventral striatum, uh, they're pretty much the same area. So the first published study of using deep brain stimulation in OCD came out of a study in Belgium in 1999, Bart Nutan. Three out of four patients showed improvement. And then um, uh, I, I was awarded a, a, a small tr uh, uh, grant from the NIMH. It took me forever to complete it and finally published the results in uh, 2010. It was only six patients. In fact, I would say that the, in that paper I mentioned to earlier about the reviewing the world's literature, I could only find about 100 cases worldwide that have been implanted with DBS. The numbers are higher now, uh, but it's, it, we're talking about somewhere between 100 and 150 cases worldwide compared to maybe 70,000 with movement disorders. But anyway, you, 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 so you, you have to take it a little bit with a grain of salt because we're talking about small numbers, but, but there, I think there are things we can learn from individual patients. Um, and, and we tried to learn as much as we could uh, from, from this group of six patients that, that we, uh, in this study. And one of the things you can do with DBS is, all, although everybody gets the device implanted, you can uh, do what's called the blinded study in terms of when the timing of when you turn it on. So in this particular study, uh, everybody was told that their device would be turned on, but we, we didn't tell them when. So the patient didn't know exactly when we would actually turn it on, and the raters didn't know exactly when. The team that was actually doing the program, in this case it wasn't me, did all, all kinds of, actually tried to trick the patient to, try, to keep the blinding as, as good as possible, and then that way we could make, keep ourselves honest to see whether, uh, even though you, you would imagine these are people who are really treatment resistant, you could have, still have a so-called placebo effect because everybody wants it to work. Who doesn't, you, you've taken this risk as a patient, the whole team is in front, you kind of want it to work and that, that could be a powerful impact on, on, on the results. So, so having some blinding is still very important even, even for surgery. Uh, um, I, I'm gonna skip this part in the interest of time. Uh, just to say that even in the operating room we saw some effects. They, they weren't on OCD. I mean, it was one of the interesting things. We started doing ratings in the operating room, saying, well, maybe the first person we brought in had contamination concerns. We were all ready to do a contamination experiment to see how it changed. People don't worry about their OCD in the operating room. I don't, I don't care how bad the OCD is. You're having brain surgery in the operating room. You're not thinking about your OCD. So we've just given up on trying to test that. Um, so w what we did find, though, is that uh, we, we could, and we, we've, this has now been reported by a number of groups, that about 50% of the cases, we, one of the biggest surprises we had, we could make people laugh if, on, on certain settings. Uh, and we didn't expect this at all, and, and that's actually you know, led to the comp a company doing a, a trial to see where this might work in depression as well. But in another paper that I won't be mentioning, there is a suggestion that, it, and in fact, when we start the programming, where we saw that smile, where we see that smile subsequently, is often where we start when we're programming for OCD. So it brings back these interesting relationships between mood and OCD. In fact, what I'm going to tell you my punchline, and just about all those patients that do, whose OCD does improve, their mood gets better first, even if they weren't clinically depressed. So the initial benefit we see, and sometimes it's immediate, is on mood, and it's not just mood, it's on motivation, it's on uh, energy, uh, and uh, I can even go one step further. I'm, I'm really beginning to think that in some of our patients that get better, what DBS is really doing, Fugan's gonna like me say this, that DBS is enhancing behavior therapy. What is it's doing is that they're beginning to approach the things naturally, even if you don't give them formal behavior therapy, it somehow changes their bias towards the world and to the things that they fear, 
and they, and they start extinguishing. That's at least my, the way I look at it. I don't have time, and I'll think, to show these videos, but what, what, what I can tell you, and it's kind of obvious from this person that was actually the first patient we have, we, uh, I ever uh, was involved with who had DBS, you can tell that she had contamination OCD just by this screenshot. She had, her hands, behind, she had hands behind her back. She's standing up because my, my room was contaminated. She wouldn't sit down. All right, and then um, she was in the study that I just mentioned, and after a month of DB, active DBS, she's sitting, and I don't know if you could see it, but she's actually smiling, too. Uh, and so, I, I, you know, so after seeing this, I said, oh, I can't believe it. In a month, I had somebody who was doing better. And I mean, not, we're not talking about a Y-box of zero. In fact, if you look, so there's the same person scores. Y-box goes up to 40, which would be extreme. She's start, starting at 36. She has surgery. And then we actually turn the device on in this blinded fashion I just described in our Y box within a month goes down to about a 20. So, you know, significant symptoms, but the rate of change was, was actually quite remarkable. Uh, and then she stayed out in this range of about 10 to 16, which isn't bad. And again, we're not, we're not going to zero. Uh, and then we had a scare. Uh, we, we, she, was, she was out in the Midwest, I was in Florida, and she called and said, it's really, the OCD is getting bad, and so it seems like it's all coming back. And we blamed it on her husband, it must be something he's doing. And um, it turned out it wasn't his fault, but was, we brought her back, and it turned out that one of the batteries had failed on the right side. And, and, and this is how naive we were at the time. We, we were calculating battery life based upon settings we're done for Parkinson's disease, but we were using much higher currents. So the batteries, and we know, we've learned this lesson now, that at about a year out or 18 months, you've got to start thinking about replacing the batteries or using rechargeable, which is, which is available now. And so we, well, we replaced the battery, and she, she's, I, I, last follow-up was about five years out, and she's continued to do pretty well. Not everybody does well, so this is that first six patients. This is somebody who did not do well despite everything we tried. There's another one in here, nothing. So four out of this, this initial six, we show an improvement. Another interesting thing to look at, look at this person in red. This person wasn't getting better. We're at about nine months. And in about nine months, I'm just scratching my head. What else can I do? I radically change the settings. I turn up the voltage as high as it's safe, and he improves. And he stayed, stays well. So, um, and, and, and it, this is actually a lesson for those of you who also followed some of the DBS work that's going on in depression. Again, I, I want to reiterate, it's very hard in an individual case to, to come up with an algorithm. You, you have to do a lot of optimization. And I even worry that some of these other trials that are going on with depression are going to be negative because they, 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 they haven't fiddled enough with individualizing the settings. So we have four out of six in this initial study at 12 months. Um, and th this is something I alluded to. Now, now as researchers, we're all really careful. We, we pick a primary outcome measure. In this case, it's the Y box to measure severity of OCD. But we measure all kinds of other things, too. But, but, and and, and I, I did that. Uh, and, and, and you have to be careful interpreting it. But something kind of fell out of these data that, that interested me. And so there were two other measures we did, the profile of mood states, and there's something called the SF36. And the only thing is just six patients. You don't, look, you don't expect significance. But the only thing that came out significant compared to baseline, actually in, in all six patients, not just the four that got better, is they had improvements on measures of vigor activity, decrease in fatigue or inertia, and increase in vitality. And my sense is that those are some of the, the active ingredients and what helped what the patients who did get better with their OCD and show improvement. There have been larger studies, larger case series. Uh, this, this is a collection of cases from ben, Penn Greenberg put together. And again, about the same response rate, about two-thirds of patients getting better. What about safety or adverse effects? Uh, the reason you, you know, we have to be very careful about uh, telling people about the risks is because they can be serious. The most serious being brain hemorrhage. And one of the things that the, the neurosurgeon does very carefully is identify you know, where they're going to place the electrode. A lot of time is spent in making sure we're going to get it to the right place. Equally important is how you get there. 
Because what they, what they do is they have to carefully map the trajectory to make sure they don't hit blood vessels. And, the, and they thank God in the cases that I've been involved with have done well. But there was one, in the, at least in one in the literature of a case of OCD, where there was a small hemorrhage. It, it wasn't even symptomatic. I mean, nobody even knew they had it. It seemed to have resolved. But when they went back and they, they did a, a x-ray, they found that there had been evidence that a small blood vessel had burst. But it, it fortunately didn't result in any any uh, uh, symptomatic changes. Infection is common. After you get through the surgery, you recover from that, everything goes well. Most of the, uh, so far, most of the other side effects we see are related to the settings on the device, and it can, they can, you can reverse them. The way you can induce them, you can reverse them. And one of the most common ones, actually, is hypomania. Uh, that, that's true of this target, uh, that we can make somebody so, so happy that it's, it, it gets them into trouble. Uh, and we, we had one patient who actually had to be admitted for hypomania. And so we've learned to be a, a lot more careful about settings. And one of the things I learned very early on is I don't make a setting change and have somebody now go home. We, we have people stay around for a, a long time to make sure that um, they're doing well, or at least they're not having any problems. Um, so this was, this was as of last year, uh, when I put together this report, we had 100 cases in the literature, five different anatomical targets. I, I, the one I've been mostly talking about is what, what I like to call ventral capsule, ventral striatum. Other people call it the anterior limb internal capsule. Other people call it the nucleus accumbens. These are virtually the same targets, but there have been some other ones that are very different places in the brain. Uh, but uh, overall, we're talking about uh, more than half the cases uh, 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 seem to show uh, improvement in OCD. How does this work? How does OCD work? I, I mean, we, we thought that it would be uh, working the same way we thought ablation would work, that we're, we're, we found the circuit that produces OCD symptoms that people can't control, and now we're going to interrupt it. We're going to disrupt it somehow. And in the case of DBS, we stimulated very high frequency, and, and we felt the, uh, the most neuro, uh, basic neuroscience told us that that kind of frequency would actually interrupt the activity, would, would blockade neuroactivity. It turns out, as uh, neuroscientists have, have done some more basic science work, that it's, it's, it, there's evidence that some of these large white fiber tracks can actually carry an impulse at 135 hertz, and they may carry it back to other places in the brain that then cause inhibit somewhere else, inhibit the structure somewhere else. So uh, the simple notion is that we're just interrupting the circuit uh, uh, is probably inaccurate. That they're actually, it's not just inhibiting the circuit you know, directly, there, there may be some other uh, activation of some uh, uh, fibers that are passing by where we're stimulating. What do we need to, for the future, we still need to confirm efficacy in larger uh, studies, uh, uh, identify those people who are, or, who are uh, where this might work best, refine our targeting. And I'm going I'm to end with this last note. I, and I think when the, the, the story is told, I don't know when the story will be over, uh, I, I, don't, I think the lasting contribution of DBS and OCD or in psychiatry in general will be to help us learn more about the, these circuits, whether they're the circuits mediating OCD or the circuits mediating depression, and hopefully that will lead us to, uh, to an understanding that allows us to develop less invasive treatments. And so I think as, as you know, I, ho I hope, you know, hopefully we can help some pa patients along the way, but it's important for us as, as clinicians and researchers to learn as much as possible so that we can then develop something that's, that's safer and less invasive. And in terms of less invasive, maybe, so the, the, this is what I was referring to earlier, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, I, I recently looked at some of the literature. Uh, others here probably have more experience than I do uh, with it. Uh, I, I think it's, um, it's unclear how effective T, uh, TMS is in OCD. There's a newer generation of TMS that seems very promising that I think everybody's interested in. fact. Pe uh, Damien Denise uh, wrote an excellent review and said that it looks like there's a signal there, but we're not sure. But there, there's a newer uh, brand, so to speak, a new, new, newer type of transcranial magnetic simulation that might be better suited to OCD because some of the structures that seem to be involved in the circuitry of our symptoms are a little deeper 
and probably can't be reached that easily by conventional TMS. So deep TMS uh, may offer some promise, and I, I look forward to seeing some of that work done. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So some of these faces up here, you will, ha you will be very familiar because you saw them in the morning, and some of these faces, you will be, they'll be familiar to you because you went to their workshop. But some of these faces will not be familiar to you because you didn't go to their workshop. So I want to start the, so this is the final event, and I have a stack of questions, and we have lots of thanks, thank yous, and thank you to all of you who stayed to the bitter end. But I think I want to start by just going down the line and having each of these people introduce themselves, particularly for the people who were not morning speakers, so you know what they did and who they are. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sony. Why don't you start? Hi, I'm Sony Pomani. I'm a secretary of OCD New York. I'm also a licensed psychologist who works with OCD spectrum kind of from childhood all the way to adulthood. And Sony did the workshop on body dysmorphic disorder. <laughs> you want to pass it to Fred? Thank you. Uh, Fred Penzel, I'm a psychologist, licensed psychologist. I uh, work out in Huntington, Long Island. Uh, I have a group there. We specialize in uh, OCD and related disorders, trichotillomania, body dysmorphic, the, the works, basically. So, uh, Hi, I'm Alan Wegg. This one? Yes. Um, I'm a, a licensed psychologist in New Jersey. I run a multi therapist uh, independent practice called Stress and Anxiety Services in New Jersey, where we focus on cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety disorders, mostly OCD for children, adult, uh, adolescents, and adults. I'm also one of the founders and a vice president on the board of directors of OCD New Jersey, and I did the presentation this morning on storytelling. I got it. I'm Figan Nizirolu, president of OCD New York. I'm also clinical director of Biobehavioral Institute in Great Neck, New York. Uh, and we specialize in OCD spectrum disorders, and I've uh, also worked with body dysmorphic disorder, hypochondriasis, and hoarding. And we have some literature out there. But as president of OCD New York, I beg you to please become members so we can continue to have these types of conferences for you. And um, we also hold monthly or every other month, go to ocdnewyork.org to check on the various activities. We do have workshops and conferences throughout the year. Thank you. Um, Anthony Pinto. I'm a research psychologist here in the Columbia OCD program under uh, Dr. Simpson. And uh, my particular interest is in obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And I did the workshop on that earlier. Uh, and, and thank you all for, for being here today. I'm Steve Poskar, I'm Vice President of OCD New York. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist at Spectrum Neuroscience and Treatment Institute, um, and I focus mostly on OCD and OC spectrum disorders, as well as high-functioning autism. Hi, I'm Kathy Budman, and I am uh, the Director of the Movement Disorder Center in Psychiatry at North Shore LIJ Health System, and I'm a specialist in Tourette Syndrome. Hi, I'm uh, Michael Block. I'm a psychiatrist at Yale, and I uh, mainly study uh, OCD, Tourette's, and trichotillomania across the lifespan. Go ahead and stand up, Tony, because you're in the back row, so people back are not row be able to see intros. you. Hi, I'm Tony Puliafico. I'm a psychologist here at Columbia New York State Psychiatric Institute, um, and I'm involved in a lot of treatment and research uh, with regards to OCD across the lifespan here at Columbia. Hi, my name is Carolyn Rodriguez. I'm a, a research psychiatrist here in the clinic of uh, Blair Simpson. And um, I, my research is focusing on novel treatments for adults with obsessive compulsive disorder as well as hoarding disorder. Hi, I'm Marla Deibler. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. I'm on the board of directors of OCD New Jersey. And I'm the director of the Center for Emotional Health of Greater Philadelphia, which is a practice right outside of Philadelphia and South Jersey that focuses on the cognitive behavioral treatment of OC spectrum disorders, including OCD, tick disorders, and trichotillomania. And I'm going to see, there's one seat up here for one of you, and the other two, go down in the line. You guys shouldn't be in the back row. Sorry, my symmetry issues are going to come out. They should actually. And is Moira in the audience? 
Okay, so then, and then Moira Wren, who you'll see come down and get and put get a seat for her so she doesn't sit in the back, and she's a child psychiatrist. Um, so I'm Blair Simpson, and I run the Center for OCD and Related Disorders here and direct the Anxiety Disorders Clinic, and I really, ha it's been a great pleasure to partner with OCD New York with Fugen and Steve, as all, and also with OCD New Jersey with Alan to try to put together the third annual OCD conference, and I want to thank all of you for coming because, as Fugen said earlier, if you weren't here here. We just be talking to each other. And really our goal is to really be in dialogue with all of you. I think one of the, inter well, I'm sorry I didn't say it earlier in the day, one of the unique things I think about the OC Foundation um, in general, the international as well as the local chapters, um, the conferences really are patients, families, and professionals together all talking together, all in a room together. And that is uh, sometimes in the mental health profession, you're used to talking to each other, but you never actually talk to necessarily to families and patients all together in a room. And I actually think it's one of the unique and wonderful things about this organization that really makes it quite different. And we're all really here to try to raise OCD awareness, whether it's in our communities or in our extended families, trying to help someone we know who has it to get treatment, trying to help ourselves get treatment. And I, of course, am really interested in how do we raise enough awareness in the government and in our state so that there's actually increased funding, not only for clinical care, but also for research. So um, I also want to say thank you. We had all these wonderful volunteers today. And if they would just, I know some of them have gone home, but if you would just stand up for a minute, because they all sort of donated Jet and Sarah, come on, from Hofstra. And, yes, OK, right. So, so these guys, um, you know, showed you the way, put your, put your, you know, they did a lot of the sort of legwork and we're all really, really grateful. So we stand up on the stage and it looks like we get the credit, but they actually get a huge amount of the credit. Um, then also I want to just say thank you to all these presenters who we just sort of, when Fugen said, okay, you guys can host it, we sort of called on our buddies, right? Would you come out today on a Saturday? It's a beautiful day out there, but they donate their entire day to come here for no pay other than a small sandwich. <laughs> you know? So, you know... And one thing that's really helpful to all of us is you have an evaluation form in your book, in your pamphlet, and we really want your input. We tried to do some things a little differently. If there was something that really didn't work for you, it's okay, please tell us. And I was already going to say to Fugan, obviously next year, something, a talk or a workshop on inflam you know, pandas, pans, cans, there's so many questions and so much interest in that, you know. But this is the moment to sort of give input. If this is if you if this is the first time you come, what would get you to come back? Uh, what would get you to tell three of your buddies and bring them to? And if um, you this is you know you've come before, why would you come back again next year? And if you can give as much input as possible, that's really helpful to uh, the planning for next year, which will be at another institution. Because Fugen is a wonderful idea of circulating this so that it really gets as broad a base as possible. Okay, so I with, just, go I ahead. I would also just like to ask everyone to fill out those little forms that ask for your email and where you heard about the conference so that we know where to target our efforts next year. Uh, we'd like to have more and more people come. Uh, for those of you who have come this year or last year, of course we want you to come back and hopefully we'll have more interesting and more information, uh, different information for you every year. But we also would like to get other individuals who do not know much about OCD, PANDAS, and the related disorders to come out um, to the various workshops and, of course, uh, during the OCD Awareness Week to this particular conference. So, Okay, so given that, now there are, I love this part because actually this is an opportunity where people can, people ask great questions all along, but people put particular questions um, on a card, and I'm just going to sort of moderate those questions. In, in some cases, it'll be obvious who should answer it, but in some cases, if you'd like to answer it, just put up your right hand. And it's possible to get more than one perspective. Um, the first thing I'd say is a number of the questions or comments we got were really cries for help. 
How do I get treatment? How do I find a psychopharmacologist? What do I do in this situation? Those I'm not going to read. Uh, there were a number of those. Uh, what I was going to ask is Steve to sort of comment of when people are in that situation, how can OCF help? Yeah, so uh, going to the, the main website of the uh, IOCDF, and, and they actually have a listing of both therapists and pharmacologists. It's actually done very nicely. It, it actually lets you type in whether they accept certain types of payment, whether they take certain types of insurance, what do they treat? Do they treat just OCD? Do they treat ticks? Do they do medication? Um, and so it's a, a good source of information. Um, but it is important to know that kind of these people are, are people that ask to be on the list and, and they're not all kind of um, looked at over and over again to know you know, that these aren't people that the IOCDF is endorsing in any way. These are people that, that tell us that they treat these disorders. Um, and, and so it is, but it is a good place to kind of to start your search. And I was going to ask anyone else on the panel, how, how else would you advise people? How do you find good treatment? Go ahead. You guys should all have microphones to sort okay. of share between. Go ahead. Uh, another good source that I, I often mention to people is the website of the Association for uh, Behavioral and Cognitive Therapy, abct.org, because they also have a, a referral uh, page there, and, and uh, it's organized by state and town, and generally people who belong to this organization are CBT practitioners, so it's also a good place to look. And what happens, I'm going to ask the tough question, which someone's probably thinking out in the audience, what happens if you don't have money? Like if you got a lot of money, you can go find the best psychiatrist or best CBT therapist. What happens if you don't have a lot of resources, but you need expert help? Well, first of all, I just want to mention, because I don't think it was mentioned, that the International OCD Foundation website is ocfoundation.org, just so you know where to go. Um, but in response to your question, one of the sources is a lot of times if you go to one of the larger practices, like um, biobehavioral health, or you have um, uh, Fred Penzel's uh, uh, program out there, which is, I'm blanking, I'm blanking. Western Suffolk, Western Suffolk, Psychological, Suffolk Services. Psychological Services or Stress and Anxiety Services. A lot of times we have uh, students or interns that are being supervised by uh, some of the people who have a lot of experience, and you can see those people for uh, significantly reduced rates. That's one source. Also, I think there's uh, something online called the OCD Challenge. Yes. which was being done through the uh, International Foundation also, if I'm not mistaken. So you could check that out also. That's a, a, that has its own separate website, I believe. So that's just to emphasize that. That's a world, uh, it's on the web, it's free to all users, and it's meant to be sort of a helpful sort of either adjunct to a CBT program or to help in relapse prevention. Have you actually looked at it, Fred? Uh, a little bit. I can't say okay. I'm, I'm fully conversant in it, but it, it is out there. And it, uh, one other thing I, I just wanted to mention also is that uh, you're not always tied down to who your insurance company wants you to see. There are such things as uh, out-of-network contracts and single provider agreements that you can get your company to let you go out of network, but you have to prove to them that, you, uh, that they have no specialists in their network who know how to treat this. I actually have an article online called Fight for Your Rights, and if you read it, it'll give you some uh, of an idea of how to get uh, your company to cover your, uh, your treatment with an out-of-network provider who knows OCD versus the people who are in the network who, who generally don't know how to treat OCD very well. Any, yeah, go ahead. Yes, so that, let me comment on that, right, which is obviously research sites like ours and like others of people here, if you actually are eligible for one of our research studies, all the treatment we provide is at no cost. So that can be if you have, exa if you are, if what your needs are are well matched to a study that's ongoing, it can be a wonderful way to get state-of-the-art treatment at no cost to you. And, you know, so absolutely. The only thing is you have to have some persistence there because you want to go find the right, the, the study that really matches your needs. Now, obviously, as a researcher, I love it when people want to sign up to help advance the field. It's sort of an altruistic thing um, to sort of help move the field forward. And we can't move the field forward unless we have people with OCD who are willing to partner with us. And so, um, you know, I think there's also that partnering, but absolutely that's a way to get treatment. And finally, I would just emphasize, I think it really behooves all of us, not just in the era, era of OCD, but all medical illnesses, do your homework. 
Know yourself what you need, because even if all you have access to is, let's say, a primary care physician, many of them these days, if you show up and say, I have OCD, I have been on this medication in the past and it's helped me, and I know that I w respond very well to this dose, <laughs> <laughs> you're much more likely to get what you need. So again, be an educated consumer of both cognitive behavioral therapy, of alternative therapies, and of medications that have that are potential because then you can actually sort of advocate for yourself. And that's true not even just for OCD, but anything else. Anything else on the panel around this? Go ahead, Tony. The, uh Is there a microphone to hand down to him? Sure, great, thanks. Uh, Psychology training clinics to receive therapy could be another great source, and this goes along with the idea of sliding scale fees, but oftentimes um, you can receive therapy from a training clinician, a, training, a psychologist in training who's receiving expert supervision from licensed psychologists at a fraction of the cost and is often high level care. So, you know, I'm, I would be happy to, or I'm sure anybody else on the panel would be happy to mention programs in your area, but it can be... Uh, you know, one other resource besides the ones mentioned. And frankly, a very eager young person learning about OCD who's got a very kind heart and is well supervised can be some of the best care that can be delivered because they're really invested in you um, and, and don't have a million other things that are on their minds. So I think that's a great suggestion. Anything else? I was going to say, Sony, on the OCDNewYork.org, do we not have a list of all the research studies that people are conducting? We do have a list of research studies in the New York area. Right, there are flyers outside, but you can also go back on the website and you will see the institutions that are doing and studies. And the thing to know about research studies is we're dependent on grant cycles. So we have different projects at different times because they get funded. So the bottom line of it is, is it changes all the time. So what is there now could be a different set of options two months from now or six months from now. So that's something, it's not static. That's good and bad. <laughs> yes, say that into the microphone. That's right. That, that there's, nowadays, it's actually, Sonia, it's a great point, which is nowadays, if you run a clinical trial, you are required to register it on an NIMH-wide website, which is called clinicaltrials.gov, and it's for any clinical trial funded by NIMH, and even actually by industry, that, that's large enough. An open pilot trial isn't necessarily registered here, but any large trial. That's a great comment, Sonia. Okay, so I'm gonna go on, go ahead, please. I just wanted to follow up on the comment that was made about you know finding uh, a good CBT therapist as well, and that is when you're when you're calling someone to be a, a be educated consumer, and you can spend two minutes interviewing the therapist on the phone and ask them what kind of work they do. And if you don't hear cognitive behavioral therapy, if you don't hear exposure and response prevention, walk, uh, run, do not walk away from that therapist, mm -hmm. because those are things that you can be thrown out very easily and very quickly to give you a clue that they know really what they're doing, and there's a lot that do not. So please be very proactive. Okay, so I'm going to go on to uh, another question. Uh, question, would you say that OCD is somewhat dismissed by the establishment as a disorder which is less dangerous than most others, and if so, why? And I'm just welcoming Moira Wren, who is doing double duty with her child's violin in her arm. She has come back to be on the panel, so that's dedication. But anyway, this question. Is it dismissed, and why? Who'd like to take a? No one? Kathy, please. Give, give Kathy a microphone. Well, well I think I'm encouraged, uh, and you should be too, that uh, OCD is a diagnosis that under the parity laws now is recognized in contrast to many other psychiatric conditions. So, and, and we hope that this will only get better um, as all psychiatric conditions would receive the same consideration as medical conditions, so to speak. But um, I, I think that the degree of disability associated with OCD is probably underappreciated in the community. I mean, it's a leading cause of disability. And, you know, most people aren't aware of that. So it really needs to be a, a larger public health education effort using, you know, forums like this. Alan, go ahead. Um, this is a little bit related, but um, I would say that one of the things that we do see is that in general, 
the uh, awareness of OCD is on a significant increase. OCD Texas is running an OCD film festival right now. If you go to OCD Texas, <laughs> Um, they have a list of all the you know, the big movies like As Good As It Gets and AV, The Aviator and stuff like that, um, which you really can't see online. You have to rent those movies. But then there's a whole bunch of, you know, um, short films and animated films that you can view and you can you can vote on. And we see more and more things like that where the entertainment community is um, getting involved in doing uh, different kinds of things that really... Um, uh, educate uh, about OCD, and sometimes they even get it right, so it's really good. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, New York State, um, I've been involved in efforts here at the New York State Psychiatric Institute with the Division of Services to try to raise awareness about the importance of the state mental health system thinking about anxiety disorders, which historically they have not, and OCD being one of them. And what's interesting is I, we gave a series of presentations to the services division here, and in preparation for that realized that actually the Office of Mental Health of New York State has identified five disorders that they are responsible for. OCD is on that list, and people didn't know it. So it's been a very, right, so someone recognized this is a really disabling illness and it should be on this list, but it really has been an education campaign, which we're really just at the beginning of, to really get a Office of Mental Health for New York State to realize they've got programs up the wazoo for bipolar disorder, severe depression, schizophrenia, and substance abuse. But OCD, they haven't really thought about. So go ahead. Uh, I don't know if you are aware of this, but the uh, World Health Organization includes OCD among the top 10 most disabling conditions. And the uh, Social Security Administration also recognizes it as a, uh, a justification for granting uh, disability benefits. So it is recognized by the United States government as a, as a source of disability. So the answer to whoever asked that question is, you see it's sort of mixed. There's some evidence to suggest that it is being more recognized, but still their clinical services and research are not to the degree that maybe it should. So let me go on to the next question. This might be a good one for the child people on the panel. Is it possible to see OCD-type symptoms in a child as early as two or three? Moira, Tony, Kathy? Um. Well, I guess the thing to keep in mind is that thinking along the spectrum of compulsive behaviors, I think you can see certain repetitive behaviors for sure at an early age like that. Um, and truth be told, there actually has been cases of OCD as young as ages three or four when looking back retrospectively, um, we've actually treated cases as young as four or so with very, very heavy parent involvement and kind of working in a very basic way in terms of helping a child resist compulsions. Um, you know, you generally don't see um, symptoms onset to the point that we'd consider a disorder until, uh, you know, later in childhood, but that's not to say that a, a child couldn't have um, certain obsessive compulsive symptoms that were impairing at a younger age. I think there's an ongoing study right now in um, Philadelphia. I'm sorry, is that Michael? You, you yeah, go ahead. Let I me guess let you go. I'd also just say that a lot of times, sort of a lot of obsessive compulsive symptoms can be normal in a two and three year old. And that has to be kept in mind. You know, I have a two year old now and you have to tuck them in the same way. And so it's very, I, I would say it's a very difficult diagnosis to make in someone who's two and three, in the point that I'd never feel comfortable at that age sort of saying that something's OCD and not in, in the spectrum of normal. I think there's clearly a point where obsessive compulsive symptoms become problematic. But most of those, you know, it's for someone that age, I would not diagnose them with OCD. I'd sort of treat the symptoms they had. And so is that clear? So there's normal tra uh, developmental trajectory where people can be sort of rigid or have habits or rituals and stuff like that. But for most, it just like stranger anxiety, for example, at a certain age in a child, that's a normal thing. But usually the normal developmental trajectory is you go through those phases and you, you know, then that's gone and you keep moving forward. And the question, the $64 million question is, could you recognize the prodrome of OCD early and intervene? Did you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, I've, tr I've treated people as young as four, but I say that earlier than that, uh, you know, you get into the problems of just what, it, what are you observing? Just because the behavior is repetitive doesn't necessarily mean it's OCD either. It might be an autism spectrum disorder. There could be a lot of different things 
at that age. Or as was mentioned, it could just be, you know, age appropriate uh, behavior. So I think you have to be very careful. Uh, but obviously watching someone at that age carefully who's, who's doing repetitive behavior certainly bears looking into further shouldn't just be ignored. And I think it's probably a fair thing is if you have a child and you're concerned about them, if, you know, obviously assuming you can afford it, this is not the moment to skimp and go to someone who doesn't actually have real expertise in this area. Is that a fair? I mean, like th this is one of those very hard uh, determinations and you're going to want to go to someone who's seen a lot of this and really has some sense of what it is. Is that actually, a actually you mentioned uh, if you can afford it, but the state will provide uh, diagnosis, uh, you know, diagnostic uh, services and, and uh, assistance for the, the very young. They, I think in New York State we have, you know, there's a starting early programs and early intervention programs that the state has. It doesn't cost you anything. It's funded through the state uh, family court system, if I'm not mistaken. And, and that doesn't, it won't cost you a penny. They'll come to your house and evaluate your child, too. So and it's, Moira and Tony, how young does your program go to? Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see kids as young as four years old. In, um, in the evaluation program. Right. Which is also at no cost, which is funded by New York State, right? Absolutely. So if you're in the tri-state area, that's another resource. Here's another child question. In regards to naming your OCD, how do you deal with a child who's given her OCD a name, stupid, but in terms of OCD stress, exclaims, stupid is me. It's part of me. So that's that idea of you've, you've labeled the OCD as bad, but now the child's incorporated the badness in them. Yeah, no, it's a tough, it's a tough question because a lot, of, in terms of the cognitive behavioral therapy that we do, a lot of the work is to almost like cultivate a detachment, so to speak, between the OCD and the child. And one of those ways is by giving it a nickname. And uh, it kind of lets the kid ex develop some power over their OCD and work on it. And at the same time, um, you know, though the child is often aware that the OCD is, you know, their own thought process, and you know, their own thought process is involved there. So I think that what I would recommend is just continued, you know, psychoeducation with a child and a family about what OCD is, how we talk about it, um, and how we can how we can respond to it. Uh, I see the psychoeducation process as a continual part of the therapy process. Um, as moving forward, particularly for kids who might have a difficult time verbalizing their own internal experience, their own thoughts and feelings. Any other comments on the panel about that? No? So this is, uh, next question is, does a death in the family contribute to increased OCD behavior? Who'd like to take that? Go ahead. The, the general idea is that when you have OCD, like many disorders, physiological or psychological, that if you are experiencing any kind of undue stress, change, whether positive or negative, like going on a trip or something like that, that that can trigger increased symptoms. So the answer to the question would be, yes, it may be a trigger. It doesn't, what we say, wouldn't cause OCD, because plenty of people have lots of bad things happen to them. They don't necessarily develop obsessive compulsive disorder. Any other comments on that? So there are two very interesting questions about religion and asking questions about religion in different directions. So one question is, I would be interested in knowing more about the role of guilt and or religion in the causing or intensification of OCD symptoms. Fred, I think you've written about this, yes? You seem like, a, this seems like a no-brainer for you to uh, try. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat, just repeat the question one more time? Uh, I'd be interested in knowing more about the role of guilt and or religion in the causing or intensification of OCD symptoms. Okay. Uh, first of all, it's important to understand that guilt is one of the hallmarks of OCD. And irrespective of whether you are religious or not religious, there are plenty of people who have guilt attached to things that have nothing to do with religion also. But OCD seems to have this uncanny way of, of latching onto the things that matter the most to you. So if religion generally is an important aspect of your life, it'll kind of get stuck on that sometimes. Uh, if, if religion is, you know, uh, involved in many of, of the activities you do, if you're, you know, for instance, I, I've had a number of uh, patients from the, the Orthodox Jewish community where religion permeates every part of their life. So it, it figures that if they have OCD, it's going to cross paths with religion at some point and, and usually does. But, uh, you know, and it can be tricky to work on because sometimes people will go to 
people who are leaders in their religion and ask for advice, and they'll get you know not very good advice because the person doesn't really understand OCD. Some and some of the things we ask people to do in therapy sometimes may seem somewhat irreligious. However, we also try to explain that we're doing this for the purpose of returning them to appropriate religious practice and, and to help them get past the guilt. But uh, I've seen people, both from religious homes and actually even non-religious non homes, uh, have serious problems with guilt. I even had a patient once who had uh, uh, religious obsessions about a religion that wasn't even their own. So <laughs> go figure, right? Any um, other comments on that's one version? And here's the other one. Do you think there's a possibility of interest in the scientific community to build a potential bridge over the chasm between a purely scientific approach to treating OCD and the investigation of treating OCD from a spiritual or faith-based perspective, i.e., creating a study that examines the role a person's healthy faith plays in encouragement, function, hope, and perseverance in coping with OCD? We'd like to take that. I mean, I, I guess I'd say that as researchers, we're interested in anything that works. Uh, if it comes from any avenue, I think anyone who has good ideas for treatments and trying to figure out where they work, that's important. Say also that, I mean, so in terms of studying religion, I think there's certainly, uh, certainly some techniques from sort of mindfulness training and Eastern philosophies have been uh, studied a lot as a uh, psychiatric treatment. I think also sort of there's been a lot of evidence that sort of uh, having a strong religious faith leads to good mental health care outcomes. I think one issue with that is uh, is if you develop a strong, can you, is that an effective treatment? It's different from if people have a strong religious grounding, does that help them in terms of their their lives. There may be other factors that are associated with that that may play an important role. And I would just like to underscore hope, perseverance. Oh my gosh, these are critical to good outcomes no matter what treatment you try. And, um, and encouragement and support, we know that these are critical factors in reducing stress and enabling people to cope with uh, uh, life's issues. So I would say, in fact, um, I am delighted when someone has a strong, uh, positive religious faith that I can use to work with them, because what that often means is they have a community that they come from, and they have deep values of how they want to lead their life, and I can use those values and connect with those values to motivate them to help get themselves better. And finally, it's critical if they have comorbid depression and get suicidal at times because it's often religion that really helps people not act impulsively or dangerously in those moments of, really, of real deep despair. So I would say um, religion of all types can be wonderful uh, as long as it can be as long as it is really oriented in a positive way towards people's lives and not into that OCD, the way OCD gets into people's religions and really mucks it up. And that's, we make this distinction between that. Other comments? Yeah, I was going to echo what you said because religion provides community and, uh, and with that community support and encouragement, motivation, and also positive activities for the patient uh, to be engaging in uh, to take them away from all of the time that's unfortunately sucked up by, by the OCD. You know, you did, the question did ask about research. And what is interesting is the National Institutes of Mental Health has been very focused on biological models of psychiatric disease and biological models of treatment. So it's increasingly difficult to get funding even to do psychotherapy studies from the National Institutes of Mental Health. And so there is a way that we as clinicians and people who care about our patients actually absolutely see the benefit of this, but how you could connect this into scientific study to actually get funded through our funding agencies at this moment, that's a more complicated challenge. And my guess is a real scientific study would come more out of faith-based uh, foundations. Now, there has been, and I don't know this research very well, some very interesting work on, you know, Buddhist monks and what their brains look like and how their brains look different, if you will, than those of us who don't uh, uh, have certain practices. So there is a real interest in the field in how faith and things like that can, for example, focus you uh, or give you emotional regulation. 
but getting the funding to do those studies is really quite challenging. Other comments? Okay, another question is, um, how much does structure aid in recovery? My biggest problem is wanting to stay in bed and ruminate. I'd like to take that one on. You know, if, again, this a little bit addresses the, you know, I think of this in terms of your intensive weekly. So you want to comment on structure? What do you think of that as a... Well, I had two um, thoughts. One is we don't want routines, uh, but then you went on to say that the person is ruminating in bed. So obviously it's not that they have to stick to their routines unless we think of the person staying in bed as a routine. But I would say um, what we call behavioral activation, meaning that any time anyone is staying in bed, especially if you're obsessing, it's very, very important to put some structure and get the person moving. Um, so setting up uh, different activities that one could engage in, um, encouraging the person to get out of bed, and if they can't, um, then assigning, with the consent of the individual, assigning a family member to help them get out of bed, finding something that would motivate them. Sometimes I use, for example, you know, your daughter's going to come home at 3 o'clock. It's really not good for them to see you in bed. Can you get up, get washed an hour before at least? So find something and take her out. Um, find something that will enable the person to get out of bed and to break that uh, obsession. Go ahead. I'd also like to tie the idea of structure to uh, exposure therapy itself. So um, you know, I like to say to people that when you're working on challenging your OCD, you can do that serendipitously, just as something happens and you see, oh, there's a doorknob. Normally I would use my sleeve. I'm going to really challenge my OCD and take it with my hand and then not wash whenever it just so happens that you come across a door. But also this formalized structured exposure therapy where you say every single day between 7.30 and 9 o'clock at night or 8.30, whatever, that I'm going to be in involved in practicing these very specific exposure exercises. Uh, when people usually, uh, I always tell my patients that the two worst things for people with OCD are stress and too much time, unstructured time on your hands. And I think it's very important. People usually, when they have that kind of unstructured time, it tends to turn to symptoms. And I think well-being comes from living in more of a state of balance. And if you have a lot of time where, you, let's say, you're lying in bed or you're just doing other things, then clearly, you know, this is a life out of balance. And, and uh, I think you need to take sort of a, a more all-around approach to this and, and get people moving, get them involved in things, get them out of the house, whatever, whatever it takes, basically, even if it's just something very small and, and very minimal at first. Because I think, uh, as I say, time that's, that's left empty like that is going to be turned into symptoms. It's, it's almost inevitable. I, d I just want to go back to one um, thing I said before, though. In terms of structure, don't confuse structure with doing routines and being inflexible. Because one of the things that OCD individuals love is having a routine and having consistency. And they have difficulty shifting, meaning they can't really go from one thing to another. And flexibility is the essence of, uh, of a healthy individual. So one of the things we're trying to teach all the time is to be flexible. So if something interferes with your routine, with your structure, you need to be able to shift and adjust. So, um, you know, again, keep that in mind when you're thinking about structure. You have to be flexible within the structure. Then there's a whole series of questions about inflammation and uh, pandas, et cetera. I'm going to read this whole thing. And I'm wondering whether Michael and Kathy, and I don't know whether Moira want to comment on this. But here we go. Listen. Could inflammation, whether by the environment, infections, et cetera, be at the root cause of OCD. Also, if acute inflammation isn't treated, could this lead to reinforcement of pathophysiological circuits, which makes plasticity response to treatment more difficult as time goes on? Another version of this. With sudden onset OCD in adults, has there been any treatment with prednisone uh, for immune suppression to see if there's improvement in symptoms? What are the opinions on some subsets of OCD being a faulty immune system in which inflammatory signals dominate and anti-inflammatory or inadequate, resulting in chronic activation? Kathy, Michael, this? 
I mean, what, you know, obviously, what we've already talked about is obviously next year, one thing at the conference should be a lecture or workshop exactly on this issue, because these issues are so complicated and there's a lot of controversy in the field, and sort of a, a one minute answer isn't going to do service. So, but having said that, Michael or Kathy, okay. do you want to give? <laughs> so, so I'd say there's certainly a lot of research going into whether inflammation's uh, important in psychiatric illness in general and specifically in OCD. And I think there's a pretty good possibility that that can be, that is important. Uh, exactly how that's important in OCD still there needs to be a lot of research to establish that. Uh, that being said, there, you know, there are illnesses that are uh, like Sydenham's chorea, which is uh, associated, which is a sort of a, a uh, sort of uh, a process associated with uh, strep infection that uh, is associated with OCD and ticks. So there's some clear examples where they can be related. Uh, that being said, I think at least as first line treatment, I think for any sort of adult and uh, kid with OCD to, that at least that we have fairly good evidence that certain treatments work, especially behavioral therapy and uh, even uh, sort of SSRI medication. So I think before I go down the road, especially if I had a kid with uh, even sudden onset OCD, I'd, I'd be at least trying to see whether those treatments work before I started looking for uh, zebras, because I think at least the, the, the vast majority of OCD cases are probably, uh, are probably, at least we have no evidence are related to that, and, and that we do have treatments that we know work for OCD in general. Kathy or Moira, do you want to say anything more, or does that, nope? Kathy? Uh, I, mean, I agree with what, what Michael's saying. I know though a few, few families have approached me to talk to me about their own personal experiences where there was a really clear demarcation of acute onset and felt that antibiotics um, had helped uh, dramatically. And so these are things we have to be open to. I think this is a, an area, as Blair said, is a lot of controversy in that you know, we know that there are probably, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a heterogeneous disorder and it's different mechanisms that will lead to those uh, cluster of symptoms and behaviors we see. And I think as physicians and clinicians, we have to be open of a possibility of all mechanisms. So, and hopefully we'll have more research to explain this more, more clearly. But it is interesting to see some of the, some newer studies that are looking at antibiotics and the use for OCD symptoms. And I think it's something we have to watch and see what we learn about and learn from our basic science colleagues. Moira is actually starting a study looking at an antibiotic, but it's not because of its antibiotic. It's because it's minocycline, which is thought to alter glutamate. So whether it actually alters glutamate or whether it actually has an anti-inflammatory activity, God knows. It could work for any of those mechanisms. But first, you have to start with it works, right? And this is another, this is a variant on this question, which is interesting. So whoever wrote this is really at the cutting edge of... Uh, Science. Uh, is anyone doing research with OCD in regards to microbial deprivation? Dealing with a diminished amount of parasites in our systems. Parasites are shown to diminish inflammation and improve immune suppression. Dr. Parker at Duke University is working with this in regards to autism. Is there interest in this hypothesis, particularly pertaining to PANS? So the reason why I make the comment that I do is uh, one of the sort of uh, 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 high science uh, annual conferences that some of us go to every year is something called ACNP. And the president uh, that year always gets to sort of, there's almost like a competition of these researchers of who, they, they, the president always gets to put together a symposium and there's sort of like a, oh, which better idea, which better symposium each year can they put together? And one entire year, it was all about this new thing about how, and I'm afraid if anyone has contamination stuff in the audience, so I apologize, but really we are walking full of microbes, all of us. Every, every aspect of us is full of microbes and that there's actually a whole history of you can actually type me and know where I've been today because of the shift. And there's a whole story of, you know, when women uh, bear children, how their new baby develops the uh, microbial environment, you know, from the mother, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a whole all burgeoning aspect of interest in this in terms of medicine and also psychiatric diseases, which is we really live in harmony with our microbes and that those microbes potentially can actually alter, for example, this is the, I'm, I'm a little far out here now, but I'm just giving you the big idea, our own gene expression and possibly alter our developing brain, but this is intended in positive directions, you see? 
So I would say, I don't think we know the answer to this question, but the, the, whoever wrote this question is obviously reading the literature. <laughs> Does anyone else want to make? And so the bottom line is, I don't think we know, but this is a hot area of science. Any comments on this one? No. OK. In autism, they're looking at, at things, and, and I think they'll probably look at them a lot. They're using, I think, probably what you're talking about is the pig whipworm. And, and, and they, it's kind of being looked at in autism now. And again, the, the question is not only, you know, does it kind of set off a certain cascade um, in our kind of immune system? And, and, I, and I think it probably will start to get studied more and more. But, it, but mostly, it is being looked at in, in autism right now a lot. So there's a question now about treatment and risk of relapse. So uh, the question is, is my son had body dysmorphic syndrome. Then he went on a cocktail of drugs and it went away. Can I expect it to return? Obviously, Sony. Well, I think that's a very good question. I would uh, vouch for a combination of CBT in combination with the medicine because it, we do know that there is a higher incidence of relapse if you're just going to rely on the medicine um, to do the work for you. So we would really encourage the combination so that CBT can teach you the skills to prevent relapse. And there isn't a question on hoarding, but Carolyn and Marla haven't had a chance to speak. So I'm just going to come up with a question on hoarding so that they're not up here. So I don't know in your workshop, was, or maybe I'll let you guys, what was the thing out of your workshop that you want to tell the whole audience? Was there any sort of burning question? I mean, I know a, b a big issue for the field is what's happening with hoarding behaviors in DSM-5. But that's one question. But if you guys have a better question to answer, please go ahead. Um, so um, in terms of hoarding disorder, as Blair mentioned, uh, DSM-5, um, the, the diagnostic manual, um, is looking at hoarding disorder as a new diagnosis. And um, we're, we're very excited to, um, to see the results of that. And uh, especially from our workshop, um, there are just a lot of people who are affected by these symptoms. And we appreciate it uh, in the workshop uh, hearing from, from all of you. And, and um, I just want to say in general, we want to thank you all for for attending the workshop. It's been, it's been wonderful. Thank you. And I would give Marla a chance to say something or answer your own, whatever question you want to answer. <laughs> a lot of people were asking about, uh, about treatment, um, in particular, the multi-component cognitive behavioral therapy. And, um, you know, we, we try to talk about these things as though, um, uh, you know, in a very positive sort of hopeful way in that we have a lot of different strategies to be able to teach people and to help them through, uh, you know, by doing exposures and helping them to develop different skills in terms of being able to change their thoughts and their emotional attachments and being able to improve their decision-making skills. But in, in actuality, it's quite difficult to do. Um, it's challenging, um, and I think persistence, it's important to, to note, is, is very important. Um, many people are afraid to approach treatment, and an even larger number of people who do approach treatment um, at some point drop out of treatment. Um, and so I think it's really important to, to emphasize that uh, therapy can work. There are a lot of different skills to develop, but it is a process. It's something that doesn't happen overnight, particularly with hoarding behavior. But if you do hang in there and do uh, persist with the process, you can develop the skills in order to improve your life. And I see as we move towards 530 when we all turn into a pumpkin, including PJ Williamson, who has been very helpful to us in the AV booth and would like was here very early this morning and would like to go home. There's one more question. <laughs> One more question, which is, what are the recommendations for weaning off medications following successful exposure therapy? Who would like to take that on? Again? Want to? Um, the rule of thumb that we use generally is after a year of being on a particular medication, be it SSRI or clomipramine, or augmentation of those, um, if you've had a successful CBT, then we would start ha having you taper off the meds and look to see how you're doing. There are individuals who can get off meds uh, completely after having had successful CBT. There are individuals who need very low dosages sometimes and are maintained on those low dosages. Um, 
actually, in addition to medications, especially in the maintenance phase, uh, IOCDF, I don't know if it's up there yet, but the, it will be, on natural remedies that we didn't discuss today, but there are other uh, some natural remedies. We don't have a lot of evidence for the usage of them, but sometimes um, they are helpful when the individual has gone through CBT and is now just in a maintenance phase and has been tapered off completely. And I want to give Steve a chance. That's the psychologist perspective. Um, and I want to give Steve a chance to give not necessarily his perspective, but the standard psychiatrist perspective. So, so we do kind of worry about, you know, if we look at some of the data about relapse. Um, and I think the important thing, really, if you're going to try to go off medication, again, unless there are kind of severe adverse effects that you're getting, that it's something that's done incredibly slowly. Um, there's really no reason to rush. And, and what we'd like to do is, is kind of decrease it as slow as possible, and then we can see over a period of time how you're doing. And because if you do start to backslide, you know, one of the things, and, and you know, often we, we think that if we use a medication and we stop the medication, if we restart it, it's going to work again. That's usually the case. It's not actually a guarantee um, that we're going to get the same response. And again, so unless there's a, a reason to go off a, a medication rapidly, to me, you know, I, I don't have objections to people going off medication if they're doing well in CBT. But to me, there's no reason not to do it incredibly slowly. And that way, if, if we drop somebody from, you know, 200 milligrams of Zoloft and I get them down to, you know, 175, I can see how they do for a month. If they're doing well, we can drop it to 150. But then at least we can catch that but before it kind of, before it happens quickly. And so, again, I, I think the, the slowness of it is important, um, especially because we do see that there's, there are decently high, high relapse rates when people go off medication. And this is an area, this was such a dominant question last year that actually Edna Fo and I wrote a grant about it, which we actually got. And so we actually have a new study starting here to try to, I would agree with Fugen, my sense of it is some people can and some people can't. And so psychiatrists, even the APA practice guidelines, have a tendency to say, don't ever come off, stay on, right? Whereas there's a sense of, but what? You're going to put leave someone on SRIs for decades of their life? And so this is actually a new study that we have, which is to try to see, can we, can we identify who can and who can't, other than what we do now, which is stay on it for a while. If you look really good, then let's go off really slowly, which is sort of prudent, um, but in fact, what I find is that patients don't often do it. They just go off. <laughs> so the question is, is can we develop some data that help us be able to better say, really, we don't advise you to go off, or it's, you might, it might be worth your trying. OK, it is 5.30. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you for staying. Thanks to the panelists. I think that's it. I'd like to thank the panel as well for giving of your time, please. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, and uh, Blair said, all of the presenters today really donated their time um, and energy prior to coming, preparing their lectures, and spending the whole day with us. So I thank all of you for coming. And thank you to the audience, because without you, as Blair said, we'd be talking to one another. And we don't, well, we could do that. But we'd I have mean, fun. We'd like have it. fun, but it's more fun with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you.